Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Ros Artis. Um, I'm the director of the Scottish Lyme Centre Trust. Um, in the last year, during lockdown, um, we were able to um, complete our stone and slate survey for Inverkeething uh, Heritage Regeneration Programme. Um, and just by way of introduction about what the Scottish Lyme Centre does, um, I'll just take you through a few slides and then I'll hand over to Fiona Stenker, who's the project uh, officer. So if you're not familiar with the Scottish Lyme Centre, we were established in um, 1994 as a not-for-profit organisation. We have two main activities, our training and education programme, which we deliver here in Charlestown, just um, four miles west of Inverkeething. Um, we have an all-weather training facility just up the road for practical hands-on training. And the crucial bit about our training and education is that it's informed by the work we do uh, with our building advisory service. So we have an in-house team um, of stonemason, building surveyors, building materials analyst, uh, which is a crucial um, knowledge and skills expertise that we've brought together, um, plus our own um, building materials laboratory for testing and analyzing um, masonry uh, building materials. So mortars, plasters, stone, slate, brick, um, anything to do um, with masonry materials. And you can see from the images here, we get involved in all sorts of different buildings from ruins to ornamental plaster work. And then on the right hand side, you'll see the reinstatement of um, external line finishes on the Scottish Parliament building, um, which I think is quite a nice juxtaposition to the, the modern upturned boats bit or whatever you want to call them. And we're based in Charlestown, and this is a view in Lower Charlestown next to the harbour of 14 historic um, lime kilns um, that were built from the 1760s and were the largest producer of building lime in the whole of the UK in their heyday. They sadly shut in 1956 when um, most of the limestone was worked out um, in Charlestown. And you can see from this cutaway drawing what happens inside a lime kiln because it's not immediately obvious to anyone um, just faced with a mass of masonry. But essentially, they are large chimneys uh, filled with coal because that was the fuel of abundance in the central belt in Scotland and pieces of limestone. And they're set on fire um, and uh, the process of making the product quick lime involves um, uh, uh, temperatures of around 800, 900 degrees centigrade, at which point the limestone loses its um, carbon dioxide and produces um, calcium oxide, which is the product material quicklime. And that's what you can see the, um, the guys at the bottom here, unloading the quicklime, putting it into wooden barrels and off it went on ships and boats um, all up the east coast of Scotland. Um, and then when the canal network and railway network came in much further afield. And here's a few images from our training courses. This is at um, New Lanark uh, World Heritage Site, um, introducing, um, uh, repointing using lime mortars on a, a rubble uh, stone wall. And we also offer courses on slating, uh, building um, traditional rubble walls, amongst other things. And we recognize that many traditional buildings have problems because they've been caused by inappropriate use of modern repaired materials, for example, cement mortars, or there's a lack of um, understanding of how um, uh, traditional building technology works and how we should repair old buildings with what materials. So that's our, that's our sort of role. Um, but we always look at buildings holistically. We take into account all the materials uh, it's made of and how they are performing. And we relate that to the detailing of building from the top down. So that includes roof coverings, junctions of different building materials, rainwater goods, uh, wall finishes, ground drainage and everything else in between. And we want to avoid situations where we have accelerated decay of masonry, as you see here, which is probably a rather extreme example, but nonetheless typical. And, you know, if we can try and introduce um, 
colour and vibrancy back to our historic buildings like we've done here at um, Pittencreef House in Dunfermline, um, I think the rewards are, uh, are very clear. So I shall stop sharing just now and hand over to Fiona from Inverkeething Heritage Regeneration. Thank you, Rob. So, um, my name is Fiona Stenka, and I'm the project officer at Five Historic Buildings Trust. Um, and I'd like to join Ros in welcoming to the seminar today. Uh, which is delivered as part of the Inverkeeping Heritage Regeneration Project. Um, and so I would like to thank uh, our main funders, Historic Environment Scotland and the National Lottery Heritage Fund. And I thought I'd start by giving you just a brief overview of the project so you know where this seminar fits into the wider, wider scheme. So it's a five-year project um, that began in April 2019 and will be running until March 2024. And it's a partnership between Fife Council and Fife Historic Buildings Trust. Um, and I've listed some of the main funding here. So you'll see there's quite significant funds from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, from Historic Environment Scotland and from Fife Council. And then there's also further match funding from um, Scottish Government and also from private sector investment as well. And this shows the four main strands of the project. So at the left hand side, we've got the High Street and the Market Cross. Um, the High Street will be um, will be a major uplift to the entire central High Street area. Um, so new paving, new street furniture, that sort of thing. And then the Market Cross, which is currently tucked away slightly at the side, will be brought out into the middle of the Mar um, Market Square area. Next, we have the A-listed townhouse, um, which is going to be repaired and redeveloped to make it more accessible. So it will become an accessible community hub run by and for the community. Um, then we also have the building repair grant scheme. And this is for private owners who can apply for grants to repair and conserve the exterior of their building and also to improve, um, improve the, uh, the look of the building. By that, I mean reinstating um, original features of the building, such as uh, traditional fashion cake windows um, or traditional shop fronts. And then finally, um, there's a really ambitious training and outreach program uh, managed by my colleague Emma Griffiths, and this seminar uh, forms part of that. Um, that's kind of a, a very brief snapshot of the project, just to highlight some other training opportunities that are coming up as well, just in case anyone in the audience might be interested. Um, we have funding for traditional skills apprenticeships and uh, we're really excited that the very first few apprentices are starting uh, with sheath masonry and local contractors next week and then there's a joinery apprentice who will be starting with five council building services um, in September and so there's still um, funding available for one more uh, private sector uh, apprenticeship with a contractor. So if there are any local contractors out there who might be interested in, in uh, this funding, please do get in touch. Um, the project can also fund uh, traditional skills training for contractors, architects and surveyors and so on. So um, that would be in things like uh, traditional line pointing or traditional plating and lead work or traditional joinery, all sorts of things. Again, if you're interested, please do get in touch, but we will also be advertising these opportunities as they come along. Um, and then for homeowners and property owners, uh, we hope to deliver a series of um, seminars later this year, covering a variety of topics on um, maintenance of properties and, and um, appropriate repairs and so on. And again, we'll be advertising that widely. So that's just a, a very brief snapshot of what we're up to at the moment. Um, and uh, I'll pass you back over to Rod now. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. That's great. Thank you. And that's fantastic to see um, 
uh, apprenticeships being um, sponsored in such a way. I think that's probably a, a first with the conservation area generation scheme. So excellent, excellent news. Um, okay, oh, wrong one. Hopefully this will do what it's supposed to do. Doesn't like that. Hang on a minute. Okay, everybody see that okay and hear me okay? Um, okay, so um, at this point, we're looking at, you know, why we want to conserve or repair buildings. Um, I'm showing you these um, six slides of quite iconic Scottish buildings, all A-listed, um, and they all have one thing in common. They're all constructed of solid walled masonry, very often with natural stone with lime mortar in between the stones, um, uh, or could be an earth mortar. Uh, the walls are generally around 600 uh, millimeters thick, but in fortifications, castles and so on, the walls can be very much thicker. Um, for obvious reasons. And it's the way the stones and all the bricks are laid that gives structural stability. The mortar serves to cushion the stones and provide weatherproofing. So it's not a glue, the mortar is not a glue. And yet these more, what we might think of more mundane buildings, your typical tenement in a town or a city, are all constructed in exactly the same way, using stone and lime mortar to construct the walls very often finished inside with lime plaster um, and uh, for external finishes lime harling and lime wash um, like you see in the cottages in the, uh, the middle uh, bottom uh, of, of the slide there. Um, the layer of lime harling and, and lime wash serves to protect the stone walls underneath and to carry uh, decoration often with coloured lime wash. So it's worth looking at a few definitions. So we're all reading off the same page as it were. Um, so conservation is uh, generally accepted to be um, actions to secure the survival or preservation for the future of buildings, cultural artifacts, natural resources, energy, or anything um, of acknowledged uh, value. Restoration is slightly different. That's the process of bringing back a building or part of a building to a simulation of its appearance at a particular period or um, earlier date uh, and should really be based on uh, proper documentary um, evidence. So I'm, do I'm using this analogy of um, uh, boats and cars, which you might think is a bit odd, but if you were to restore, repair or conserve a boat or a car, would you use the same materials as it was built with? So if you had a walnut dashboard, for example, you'd probably want it to be repaired with a walnut and not a plastic replica because authenticity is important. If your boat was made in timber, would you repair it with fiberglass? I don't think so because you value its authenticity. So if we can relate that to buildings, um, we're on a good start. And there are seven sort of guiding lights of conservation, um, which you can see um, here. Minimal interve intervention, so less is more. Um, reversibility, so whatever you do to a building should be reversible. And that's um, of great advantage when you're using lime mortars because it means you can recover building materials and you can alter and adapt them more easily than you can with um, a building that's been um, constructed with cement mortars, for example. Honesty and distinguishability, so your repairs should be identifiable but not obviously stick out like a sore thumb. Um, it should involve meticulous recording and documentation so that uh, everybody can see what has been done and with what materials. Um, you should also avoid any conjecture or second guessing of what you think was on a building or an element of a building that's missing. Um, have a respect for the age and historic pattern of building materials as they weather over time. So don't expect a bright and shiny new uh, result. Um, and 
looking at materials and techniques, um, we should replicate these to maintain the integrity of a building. So here's a bit of an extreme example. So this is St Albans Cathedral um, down in the south of England before its restoration. And this is after. Was this based on real evidence or is it part conjecture? So the beginnings of modern conservation start with John Ruskin and William Morris, who founded the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. Um, and um, as a coincidence, uh, this week we have been um, hosting uh, the William Morris uh, Craft Fellows from the SPAB on their um, uh, programme. Um, so they really enjoyed being up in uh, Scotland and learning about our buildings. Um, but the, the guiding um, uh, philosophy by John Ruskin and William Morris was really that we are custodians of ancient buildings and that looking after them was of a paramount uh, importance for future generations. And so there followed a series of charters to guide the standards and principles of building conservation during the 20th century. And they include the following. Uh, there's heaps of them, um, if you've got time to, to, to look um, through them. So legislation also plays a part, and it's actually amazing to think that the first Ancient Monuments Act was passed in 1882, um, but there followed many more acts for the likes of monuments, listed buildings, conservation areas, gardens and designed landscapes, and of course, historic battlefields throughout the 20th century. So other things to consider, um, sort of definitions, what we mean by these terms, repair, so that's work to fix and make good a building. So it could be fixing missing or broken or slip slates on a roof, for example. In terms of maintenance, that's work to a building to avoid problems developing in the future. So for example, cleaning out your gutters twice a year to prevent blockages or painting your window frames and rainwater goods every eight years or so. Um, <clears throat> interventions might include an action which has a physical effect on the fabric of a building so that could be installing a Velux window in a roof, um, as, just as an, as an example. So conservation philosophy and ethics will involve all or some of the following, repair, maintenance, conservation and restoration. And you can see uh, the modern uh, Scottish conservation practices guided by these documents. Um, <clears throat> so you have a British standard for um, the Guide to the Conservation of Historic Buildings, BS 7913, which was reviewed in 2013, and I think is now much more a useful document uh, in a practical sense than it was uh, before. Historic environment. Um, Scotland also have their uh, policy for Scotland. <coughs> uh, and that includes guidance on scheduled ancient monuments, listed buildings, conservation areas, um, and all the rest. So scheduled ancient monuments, that's slightly different from a listed building. Um, it's usually um, for unoccupied buildings uh, or structures. Um, and Historic Environment Scotland always deals directly with all matters affecting scheduled ancient monuments. So for example, our um, a collection of 14 lime kilns in Charlestown are all scheduled monuments. Um, and so um, scheduling is not the same as listing as it uses different legislation. And we have quite a few scheduled monuments in the um, uh, South Fife area or West Fife area, um, including uh, Dunfermline Abbey, but also things like prehistoric burial mounds, Roman forts, um, all sorts of different things can be scheduled. Occasionally, you get the case where a, um, a structure or building is both scheduled and listed, um, which is rather confusing. So here we've got um, a listed buildings. So we've got um, a Abbott House in Dunfermline, which is actually un currently undertaking some repairs. Um, to the external uh, line finishes, um, which have been a bit battered over the uh, last few years as the building has remained 
empty for about five years. Um, and so A-listed buildings are usually um, of special architectural, cultural or historic interest. And I think Abbott House in Dunfermline probably encapsulates all of those. Um, and then um, <coughs> uh, Historic Environment Scotland are in charge of listing buildings and they have a dedicated team who research and assess all designation applications and listing is carried out under the planning uh, listed building and conservation areas Scotland Act 1997. Um, and the wall you see there is um, uh, part medieval wall, part um, repaired by the Scottish Lime Centre's masonry squad a few years ago, um, is an important, an important um, um, piece of the, of the historic fabric in Curus, just behind the, um, the palace. So listed buildings may have characteristics that help create Scotland's distinctive character, they might be highly visible and accessible part of our rich heritage. They might express our past social and uh, economic uh, activity. They will span a, a wide range of uses and periods and generally contribute, contribute significantly to our sense of place. So, you know, why do we go and visit Edinburgh and Glasgow? Because in part, it's the architectural heritage that we have there that gives it a sense of place um, and, and history that people enjoy. So listed buildings can um, cover diverse aspects of life, including education, recreation, defense, industry, housing, and worship. And, and this is the, um, uh, the church in, in Lime Kilns, our neighboring village that you see there in the slide. So which buildings are considered for listing? Um, that's um, decided by the designation policy and selection guidance uh, published by Historic Environment Scotland. Um, so category A listed buildings um, are of um, um, architectural or historical interest, which are extend, extend, outstanding examples of a particular period style or building type on a national or international le uh, level. So here we've got an image of uh, Roslyn Chapel in Midlothian, which is um, A-listed. Here we have um, um, Wardlaw Mausoleum, um, just outside Bewley in Inverness Shire, um, B-listed um, and um, conserved by the Scottish Lime Centre way back in um, 1997, I think. Um, and you'll see that we took great pains to reinstate the external finishes and then pick out um, the uh, buckle coins, whoops, sorry, uh, the buckle coins in a pink lime wash and the, the, the rest of the harling is in a sort of creamy lime wash as part of our conservation works. And then our own um, uh, buildings in Charlestown where we're based, um, a good example of a sea listed building. The buildings um, were former estate workshops for Broom Hall at the state, the seat of the Earl of Elgin. Um, and we were able, um, way back in, oh, golly, when did it finish? I think we finished the project in 2000, but we were able to harness one of the first Heritage Lottery Fund uh, grants towards um, the um, uh, uh, restoration and conversion of the workshops into our offices and teaching space. Um, so they're normally sea listed buildings, representative examples of a period style or building type of local importance, um, which may have been uh, altered. And indeed, we have altered it by adding on a timber framed extension, as you just see in the uh, right hand side of the shop there. Come on, computer. bear with me. Okay, so um, when a building is listed, uh, it is illegal to alter, extend or demolish the building without listed building consent. Um, so here we have a case of um, some little cottages on uh, the west coast of Scotland. Um, and in this case, um, we wanted to reinstate the external hauled finishes and lime wash finishes. Um, which had been lost 
um, over time through um, lack of maintenance. Um, and so we re were required to obtain listed building consent to reinstate these finishes. And we also had to uh, provide evidence um, that those finishes um, uh, had existed at some point in time. Um, we're quite good at um, uh, detective work like that. Um, but routine maintenance and repair using like-for-like -like materials does not require listed building consent. And crucially, and this is very important, it's the local planning authority who decide whether listed building consent is required or not. That's not a historic environment Scotland um, decision. So how many listed buildings do we have? We have uh, around 47,000 listed buildings in Scotland. Around about 8% are category A listed. The majority are B listed, so that's 60% and 32% are category C listed. Um, and you'll see an example here uh, of Bankton House um, uh, in East Lothian. You can, you can just see it off the A1 if you're going east towards um, uh, Dunbar um, and it has um, its lovely external copper ass lime wash finishes, quite distinctive. So how do you find out if your building is listed? You can contact your local planning authority, um, or you can search on Historic Environment Scotland's um, website portal um, and you'll find a description of the listing of your building. So it, that will highlight what's important about it um, and describe the building and, and the materials it's, it's made from. Um, conservation areas are slightly different. They're um, uh, designed to preserve and enhance neighbourhoods of special architectural and historic interest. They could also include things like trees or any designed gardens or landscapes. Um, permission for even minor works may be needed in a conservation area. And Scotland currently has uh, more than 600 conservation areas, um, which will go some way to safeguarding some of our most important historic places. Um, so your local planning authority can tell you if your property is in a conservation area. Um, so conservation areas can be used to protect important groups of buildings, open spaces, planned towns and villages, street patterns or historic uh, gardens or designed uh, landscapes. And conservation areas are des designated under the Planning Listed Buildings and Conservation Areas Act 1997. Um, and they're usually designated by local planning authorities um, and they must meet the criteria of special architectural or historic interest, the character or appearance of which is desirable to preserve or enhance. So um, just some examples of different conservation areas we have um, in Fife. We've got 48 conservation areas in all. Um, so it could be something um, like um, one of our small fishing ports uh, up the East New York of um, and Fife. Um, Charlestown Village is a conservation area. Um, it's a model village that was designed around the workplace, around the lime works. Um, so all the little cottages you see there uh, were for housing the quarriers, um, the lime burners, um, all the, and all the other associated um, uh, uh, industries that uh, centred around Charlestown. So we had a brickworks, for example, we had a foundry as well. Um, so it wasn't just the lime works, it was quite a self-sufficient um, little village um, in terms of production of work. And then of course, we come to Inverkeething, uh, a good example of a grouping of buildings from different areas, but collectively preserving the building lines of a typical medieval borough in Scotland, comprising a rig pattern of development with mainly traditional stone and slated buildings fronting onto the main street with narrow plots of land, also known as rigs behind them. And Inverkeething has a surprisingly rich architectural heritage ranging from medieval times through the succeeding uh, centuries right up until the 20th century. Some of the most prominent buildings along Inverkeething's um, main street date from the 19th century and utilize both the local hard and dense dolerite building stone and several local and not so local sources of blonde and red sandstone. And you can see from this um, image, I think it's about uh, 
1890s or so um, of um, uh, the um, market and fair space um, in the, right in the middle of Inverkeithing. So interventions um, can be made by local planning authorities for unauthorised works or alterations or extensive, uh, extensions to a listed building, um, uh, also for dangerous buildings, uh, for processing planning permissions, uh, repair and maintenance issues and building warrants. Um, so um, certainly um, the aspect of dangerous buildings um, local authorities um, are responsible for public safety, so can actually intervene um, and fix um, a dangerous building and charge the owner um, if they're unwilling to uh, repair uh, the building themselves. But we can also have um, uh, the protection of flora and fauna. Um, so particularly I'm thinking of uh, bats and certain um, uh, 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 birds. Um, that are protected um, and you can find out more information from um, uh, the Bat Protection League, the Royal Society for the Protection of Buildings and uh, Birds, sorry, um, uh, for further information on that. Um, so for example with bats, um, if they're actually nesting in a building, that means that works cannot be carried out while, while they are still nesting and that might delay works. Um, um, I think we came across an example of this um, a while back in Applecross. Um, we had written some um, uh, uh, building specifications for repairing the church at Applecross, um, and we thought the work was going to be carried out between sort of July, August, September. Um, and lo and behold, we get a phone call in November saying, oh, all the works were delayed because we had nesting bats, and now we want to start uh, doing the line works in November and you think oh my goodness November in Applecross so you know wind driven rain cooler temperatures so that um, meant we had to reformulate some of the um, the mortars at least um, to cope with um, cooler temperatures and um, so that they would cure um, within a reasonable period of time before uh, any uh, uh, protection and and uh, of the mortars uh, could be removed. Um, so that's also the case for nesting protected birds um, of all sorts. Um, so if we have a quick look at what influences um, uh, at the look and the feel and the materials that our traditional buildings are made of, um, I think probably geography and geology are probably top of the list. And you can see from, um, you can see from the, the uh, uh, geology map here that the geology of Scotland is very, very complicated. And if you compare that to uh, England, for example, um, it looks like there's been an explosion um, uh, on our shores. Um, and that gives rise to very different buildings um, in different parts of, of Scotland utilizing local materials. And we shouldn't forget that, um, uh, you know, traditional buildings from 200 years ago or so, it was horse and cart technology used um, to uh, transport building materials, particularly bulky ones like stone, sand, timber, um, and lime. Boats and ships were used for longer journeys. So um, Charlestown Lime Works is a good example of that where uh, the bulk of the, the lime was uh, transported by boat or ship um, to different ports. Um, uh, 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 around the Scottish coast. And then of course we had um, the first kind of railways, horse-drawn railways, and they later by, you know, motorized railways and canals, which obviously reached a much uh, wider network. And then of course we've got uh, vehicles on roads um, as well. And we're all very conscious of this now, you know, road miles for various different uh, materials um, and that we need to be, um, careful uh, about how we transport materials around um, the country. So, for example, in um, Dunfermline, um, uh, a lot of the traditional buildings are very often um, constructed of a local blonde sandstone, which over time weathers to a grey colour, hence the name for Dunfermline is the old grey toon. 
But in Aberdeen, for example, traditional buildings are mostly of local granite construction. Um, here you've got a coarse squared um, uh, granite uh, uh, building um, because that was the, 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 the building stone of abundance in that locality. And because traditional buildings were generally bulky, heavy, like stone, slate, lime, sand and timber, all won by hard labor and very little mechanization at first, the embodied human energy put into producing traditional buildings is enormous in terms of man hours. So the relationship between building materials, construction methods and the resultant building form usually um, gives rise to um, one or one and a half story buildings in rural areas, quite often with dormer windows, which is a particularly Scottish feature of traditional buildings. Or in urban settings, you can have two and a half stories, as we see in Inverkeething mostly, and up to four plus stories in our larger towns and cities. They usually employ sliding slash and case windows, which are set well back from the wall face with an ingo of around about six inches, giving added protection from driving rain. And in Fife, um, pan tiles might be used for simple roof forms, slate being better suited to forming more complex roof shapes with dormers, valley gutters, and other interruptions. And it's worth noting in Fife, there was no indigenous build, um, roofing, uh, roof covering materials other than um, thatch. Um, so that's why we have uh, the production of pan tiles uh, in Fife, and it's a feature of, of, of many uh, buildings in Fife on roofs. And, Traditional pre-1919 buildings, that's roughly what we are using as a cutoff date from when we moved from solid walled masonry buildings to other forms of construction like cavity wall, steel frame, and a plethora of other things we've done in the 20th century. Some have been more um, successful than others, shall we say. Um, so traditional buildings are eminently repairable um, if we and adaptable because we're using like for like materials like natural stone and lime mortars and are therefore more sustainable in the long term through good maintenance. And timber sash and case windows are also examples of features that can be repaired relatively easily and upgraded to reduce drafts and become uh, more acceptable um, for modern comfort levels. Um, but if we compare um, uh, traditional buildings to modern construction, most modern construction products are mass produced. Things like bricks, concrete blocks, cement, um, and many are man-made. So PVC for windows, for example, MDF for kitchen cupboards, um, and the timbers are treated with high levels of preservation uh, preservatives requiring uh, uh, in comparison vast amounts of embodied energy. High levels of insulation are normally incorpor incorporated into the design, um, things like rock wool or insulated plasterboard. Um, but these materials are then placed in a fashion that doesn't really allow for easy ad adaptation of the building in the future. And when components fail, they are simply thrown away and replaced with new ones, um, which is really, um, you know, I think this probably highlighted in the last 12 months what a throwaway society we are, that we really ought to take stock and think a bit more closely at how we um, uh, use building materials um, and what the consequences are um, for the future. Um, and we'll have a, a better look at that um, a bit later on when I come back at um, 5 to 11. And I see Marcus is waiting. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And hopefully, Marcus, you can share your screen. Yeah, I'll just. Cool. Thank you. On the edge of technology here, as usual. Can everybody see that okay? Can you see that, Ros? I'm guessing we can. Yeah. Okay. So um, th 
thanks for inviting me along today uh, to speak really just from the supplier's perspective. Um, we're going to take a very quick look at what suppliers do and things to consider in, in ordering natural stone. Topics briefly covered are extracting the stone from the quarry, bedding planes, rubble sizes and sizes for masonry, how we cut it up, how we dress it uh, in you know, masonry carving and surface dressings, how we produce walling stone, uh, lead times, delivery and storage, and what information we need for an order. Just going to touch on a few of those things and just whisk through those. So firstly, we should point out that since the very first moment that anyone anywhere uh, decided to pick up a stone and use it to build, it's always been a tough, heavy and energy intensive skilled job. And whilst things developed and mechanized, it did become easier, but still the material dictated the outcome and required great care in its working. Time moves on and here shown are a couple of hour quarries showing block and walling stone extraction with the walling material generally found above the cleaner, purer masonry material in most quarries. Uh, just to note here, you can see, so this is Swinton quarry and in the top third, this would predominantly be rubble material in here and from, from sort of about this position down, you would be into masonry block. And you can see here the rubble that we're producing and, um, uh, and then the block stone being produced as well. So in a quarry like this, nothing is, is wasted. Going a little further back to simply demonstrate that the principles of digging the block has little changed as it is largely dictated by the geology that you're digging. Here we see Balak Mile Quarry, 1921, demonstrating trenching and wedge splitting. That's uh, this picture in the top left here. You can see the face behind them. You can see that they've picked a trench uh, between here. And then along here, you can see uh, wedges driven into the stone. So this stone is open on three sides and the natural bed is below it. And you can see that how they're wedge splitting that off there. Um, and then Locker Briggs in 1937, this other picture showing drilling and splitting using black powder explosive to gently split the block al along with wedging along the natural beds. So you can see that they're wedge splitting here um, and they're, they've got, you can see the drills here and you can see how they're splitting, splitting these out. And there, there's a close up of that same Locker Briggs image. So you can see the wedges driven in. Now these are the natural beds of the stone. So they're not making these beds. They are the natural places where this stone is splitting. Um, and you can see a drill mark there and you can see the black powder marks here where they've split that stone. So they've drilled that, they've reamed it and then they've put a blast down through there and split it off. And you can see a natural joint here as well, which has given them a way to move that stone out. Uh, here's, um, uh, this is more wedging shown here at Corncockle Quarry in 1937, and also an image of Hales Quarry 1913, uh, splitting out the legendary steps and plats that adorn many properties throughout the central belt, and which were available in great size from parts of this famous quarry. So uh, as, as an obvious example, if you walk along somewhere like say George Street in Edinburgh, you'll see the uh, uh, each building has a basement and you've got a large set of plats and steps going across, bridging the gap across to the, the front door. And Hales produced this fabulous, very, very strong, hard, very level bedded flat stone, uh, which was absolutely perfect for this material. And, and so the geology was used for its best use. And up here is just a more example of using wedges to split blocks out. So this is um, a further quick glance at Ballock Mile Quarry 1921, showing the incredible scale and work in demands. And just always of interest to note the crazy three ladders tied together. Fancy that as you start to work every morning, climbing down that. But you can see that they are uh, uh, just, the stone is easily worked and they're literally able to cut down through using picks 
and then they're following the natural dune bedded laid uh, beds. You can see all of the natural beds in this stone. And if you saw some of that stone in a wall now, you'd see all of the bedding uh, still existing within it. Uh, and here's just a good example. That's Corn Cockle Quarry in 1937. So you can see these really had for 100 or more years prior to that been really bringing out some massive quantities of material, help, helping build um, their own areas, but also the central belt of Scotland. This is Course Hill 1937, showing them working to natural joints, showing also the thinner, higher bedding and chain sling lifting. So you can see the thinner bedded material up the top in between clay beds, uh, excellent for walling. You can see it would go into dry stone walling or you know field walls and uh, rubble walls easily. It's all coursed, falling out the ground coursed. And then suddenly you get into the masonry block uh, down below. And you can see here the natural joints and all of the things that we've talked about previously being incorporated um, in this quarry as well. OK, and then the modern mechanised version of all we've just seen, showing that whilst mechanisation has certainly changed things, still the geology entirely dictates the process of extraction and its suitable uses. Um, and here, this is just a photograph of Darnie Quarry. And uh, you can see that the uh, material here, you can see uh, a, a quarryman standing here. Um, the scale of this quarry is vast and you can really pretty much choose the height of block you want to take out of here. And these higher beds that we're working as well, these are much more colorful, um, variable material. And that is all going straight into the factory to make walling products, um, which just shows the sustainable use of the stone. And up above here, you can see some images from a Portland quarry mine uh, where they're digging out very, very, um, clean Portland base bed block and also some of that being sawn up on the top when it comes out of the mine. So here showing the other end of Hales Quarry in 1935, coarse and random walling curves and sets literally falling out of the ground here. Ironically by 1937 when a desire to use it was almost for a time at an end. So we've seen the other end of Hales Quarry where the plats and steps arrive but in this area, you can see it was literally just made for these fabulous coarse and random walling products. Uh, and you can see just the kind of scale that was going on at Hales Quarry at this, at this time. Railways were put in, feed railway, railways were coming across, and there were stockpiles of walling uh, lying in all of these places. Just an incredible sight, some of these quarries were. Um, OK, and so here at Swinton Quarry with rubble stone back in vogue, once more the automated production of the material from the higher beds in the quarry face, whilst masonry brought from lower down can be seen in the foreground. So there is that heap of rubble that I showed you in the previous picture, and that is loaded these days using a riddle bucket. So it's loaded clean into tippers and delivered straight to site. And that is building things like uh, dry stone walls, um, but it makes the quarry very sustainable um, by bothering to make that material into something, um, which is the way to really make these quarries uh, make sense. Just some more images of the same showing production of suitable products from suitable areas of the quarry. So again, you can see rubble production at the top, lower down drill rigs uh, in operation, splitting out the blocks. Uh, that's a, a drawn back view of the same thing. And here we have Darnie Quarry, again, sh say, showing the same thing. And you can see that, like in the earlier pictures uh, taken in the 1920s, you can see we still bench out uh, and create ledges just exactly the same as they did. And that is the correct way to work. You're working to the joints that nature has given you in, in any quarry. So they will all differ in, in, in terms of how you extract from them. Just an example here of drilling and controlled splitting of masonry block. You can see here uh, a 
remotely controlled drill rig drilling holes and here you can see the drill marks and hammer and uh, wedges and how we drive those in to be able to control and split a block uh, very easily. So this is showing hydraulic wedges inserted into pre-drilled block and expanding to split the block. So you can see the split now, you can see the drill holes I was talking about. These are just a hydraulic version of those hammer, hammer driving ones that I showed you before. Uh, and they're placed into the holes. They all expand very carefully at the same time and they place a crack along that. So it's a bit like a notepad, a jotting pad where you can tear the serrated paper out cleanly. That's exactly what we're doing in a quarry. So just rolling back a few years uh, in Swinton Quarry, an example of manual plugging and feathering similar to previous early shots of Hales Quarry. So you can see here, there's um, the row of drill holes. There's one of the wedges in and you can see the same there they are. And then just by gently hitting those, you can just split those blocks out. You know, those blocks will be probably good two metres by probably 1500 you know, good size, really good size slab. But you can see that in a quarry like this, the stone comes out long, but it comes out low. So that's uh, that dictates what you can do with that material. And we'll get onto that, we'll touch on that again. As sedimentary stones, which you will primarily deal with in the Scottish central, central belt in vertical masonry. So we're talking about bedding orientation. Um, and I just wanted to show you this. So. We looked at that, that picture of Ballot Mile earlier where I referred to the natural bedding of the stone, so how it was laid down. So here you can see two versions of the same thing, uh, a red version, a red sandstone version and a, a gray sandstone version, and you can see the natural bedding. So in your walling products and really any products that can be pinned in, you want to keep the orientation of the bedding the same as it was in the quarry. So if you imagine this was two pieces of ashlar or rubber walling, this would be bedded correctly because the, because the weight of the stone is pressing down on these beds as they're built. And this is these would be the faces that we'd be looking at. And you can see that that will hold this stone in compression. And so will stop that stone splitting on this weaker point, which is the bedding. However, uh, we have fabulous architecture in Scotland. We have many, many buildings with fabulous mullions and cornice courses and all sorts of overhanging courses. And particularly with mullions, often they are sort of seven foot high, uh, 2.1 long. Um, and it's very difficult to get a stone 2.1 long naturally bedded especially in some of the slender dimensions that you might require in the other orientation. And so it's very, very common practice to turn them on their edge. So this picture here shows edge bedding. So this is still the face as we look at them. Uh, and this would this side here would be the reveal. And so that is known as edge bedding. Now, it's not perfect to do it and ideally you should be selecting stones that are what we would call a free stone. And a free stone means a stone whereby you cannot see any clear bedding orientation in it, which means it's equally sound in all dimensions. Whereas this stone would be weaker in this orientation than it would be in the other two because of those laminations. The one thing we always want to avoid is what we call face bedding. So imagine now this narrow edge on this right hand picture is the face and the beds now are running back into the building and this is where you'll see buildings where when frost damage gets to them the front face inexplicably begins to peel off of the off of the building and that is because it's been put in face bedded so naturally bedded is the way we want to do it edge bedded but make it a freestone if you've got to edge bed it for cornice courses they're supposed to be edge bedded for copings, they're supposed to be edge bedded. And you can find information on all of these things in various um, historic Scotland documents. You can find it in Stone Federation documents. 
and Charleston workshops will give you full advice on all of these items as well. So just a note here, rubble sizes, modern cavity wall construction shown here on the left uh, over pre-1919 solid wall construction can dictate rubble sizes. So bear in mind, pre-1919, your wall is two foot six thick. So often the scale of the walling in uh, these sizes, if the geology allows it, is often bigger. Whereas when you get to modern construction, so this is 100 millimeters thick and then as a cavity, it's much more difficult to create that split faced walling on a 100 mil bed by making it all massive sizes. So you, so you need to bear that in mind when designing new build or designing cavity thickness uh, or, or, or controlling how you want to order your stone because, because you have to apply different rules to achieve this, the, the desired results. And just as a note there, just to remember that in pre-1919 with the two foot six wall, it literally fell out of the ground to suit a two foot six wall. And that's why the walls were those thicknesses. Remember that historical masonry buildings often reflected the most economical sizes available from their local geology and stone sources. Here we have a picture of Greenlaw Town Hall. These pillar heights are ranging between about 850 to about a metre high. And if you go into a Swinton quarry, you'll find it's very unlikely that you see a stone much higher than a metre high. And that dictated the core sites in that, in that design. Uh, so the economical cutting and selection of block is key to cost of the finished product. So wherever you buy your stone, uh, it's always important that you are able to satisfy yourself that you can see a large stock so that, so that the right selection process is going on. You know, it's sustainability is critical and it is important to not be cutting up big, long blocks for very small stones. Uh, that applied uh, in the great quarries of the uh, 19th century, 18th century, um, and it still applies now that uh, we should retain length in stones for long stones and we should have a good choice to select from, from our quarries, so that we um, can make the most sustainable choice. And that means cost benefits can be passed on uh, as long as that process is applied. So satisfy yourself that your chosen supplier has a good stock and there's plenty to choose from. Okay, so primary sawing, really, this is basically think of an uncut loaf to a sliced loaf. Um, uh, here you can see a monoblade saw, so that's just like a large hacksaw cutting very slowly through this massive block. And here's a two meter saw which is much quicker, but has a slightly more limited depth of cut. And all they're doing is slicing that up like a loaf of bread. Um, and then that loaf of bread slab, as it is, is turned on its side and it goes onto a secondary smaller saw and the other four sides are cut out, giving us our saw and six sides shape. But all of these sizes are cut really generally to bespoke order. Um, just a note to say that the masonry dressing of the saw material is done by a mixture of machine and by hand and attention to detail is everything. So chisel width, chisel sizes, uh, direction of dressing and everything is absolutely critical when you're trying to match an, uh, an old building. Further examples there of how we dress it uh, in order to compete with imported products of which there are many come into Scotland these days. We have to automate some of these elements. And of course, that is very important to remove um, elements of high dust from our industry and also hand on vibration from our industry, all things that make our industry possible in the UK um, with the high levels of standards that are required. So dressing, just a note here on these, um, really just to point out that there are various dressings the older your building is, the more um, rustic and coarse these finishes will be. So if your building was say a 1700s building, 
these would be very coarse finishes designed to level and flatten off the face of the stone or to provide a key for a lime hull. But by the time you get to uh, the late 1800s, these have become formal decorative finishes. And so they're much neater, much finer, much more attention to detail. And um, you will either see them horizontally or diagonally or vertically picked or, or so, so what, really what I'm saying is that, that by this point, they've become very decorative and your attention to detail or your mason's attention to detail in matching them is critical. Which direction they're going in, uh, whether they're dressed by left-handed, right-handed masons, sometimes they're varied and you can see two hands, two-handed masons working. So some masons dress from the left to the right and vice versa. But in formal dressing, it can be down even to how many degrees of angle would be say taken on a tool finish. So it could be at 45 degrees or it could be at 30 degrees. And that would be across all stones. So it's important to look at those things uh, in terms of get, setting up your specification. Um, so cavity wall production. Just talking a little bit here about the splitting process. So we produce cavity walling now, either 100 mil on the bed or uh, 150 mil on the bed. This mostly is done through sawn off cuts from the masonry production, and that goes through guillotines. Uh, so that's split to a nominal 100 mil or 150 mil, and then it's hand dressed, hand squared to make this uh, squared walling. And that results in uh, the, the modern vogue for these pleasing types of new builds popping up all over the place, which is great to see. So now we just wanted to quickly touch on lead times, information needed um, uh, uh, to, to get what you, what, what you need quickly to site. So depending on the complexity of any job, it could be that it's a fully drawn up um, elevation and uh, it's fully detailed and all stone sizes are given and marked and shown exactly what needs to be repaired. Or if it's uh, less complicated than that, you can use uh, photogra photographs to mark up and code up stone types, uh, stone shapes. Um, and they're also very useful in taking recording detail before things are dismantled. Uh, and finally, it could be as simple as you just can take some site measurements from the ground, you know, uh, or from a cherry picker these days, those things can, can be done. But it's important to get these things early to your supplier. So this just touches on the process in the production works and there's, there are, just demonstrates there are many aspects. So early indication of basic sizes helps as slabbing can be done early, ready for hard finished dimensions coming. So if we can get, say the height, the coarse heights of the material early, it means a lot of the bulk work that making the um, sort, of, sort of the cut loaf slabs that, you, that we showed you earlier on in that process, we could have tons of that ready for the finished lengths and um, bed widths or perhaps another dimension which would which would help jobs to be on time uh, and then it depends again whether it goes straight for ashler and is then rubbed and delivered or it then has to go through the masonry works and then it depends on all the information coming as quickly as possible Earnest production cannot start until the three dimensions of each stone is concluded and thereafter any accurate templating is completed. The early planning of this saves much scaffold cost if it can be achieved. So you can see that is ultimately what we need. We need the finished length, the finished width, the finished height, and ultimately we need any templating uh, details um, and to know how many faces have been seen uh, and generally what is happening with the stone. Just a note here, site space uh, is always critical on jobs. And so scheduling of component call off 
must be considered so that your available space does not get filled with material you cannot initially use. So whilst you put in your order, it's always good to put in your order also in the order that you would like it uh, so that the material you need arrives and it's not on pallets with material you don't need, which starts to clog the site up. Uh, also, packing of high value products is important and consideration of site storage and handling must be carefully planned. Uh, because, you know, if you have this, these products are expensive and you do not want to be stacking pallets um, because, you know, this stuff needs to be treated very carefully. So just to conclude very quickly, we recommend that you get to know and understand the supply and quarry you're going to use, and you should feel at liberty to visit your quarry and um, and really get to know them and understand. And, and any quarry that uh, I would say any quarry would would welcome your visit. So I think that is that's something to bear in mind. Same goes for your masonry yard. Some places uh, the quarry and the masonry yard are the same place, some places they're not. So get to know and understand your masonry yard and understand the level of materials that are produced and assure yourself of the quality of the materials that you're getting. Ensure the information on stone type and detail is provided in good time to promote best lead times. so that you get what you want when you need it and it all fits, fingers crossed, just right. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Marcus. My pleasure. Um, always super informational and I always learn something every single time you do that presentation. Um, so yes. Um, are you sticking around for a Q and A later? No. What, what time will that be, Stacey? Uh, I think it'll be probably about twelve. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I've got a I've got a Stone Federation meeting at eleven, so I'm going to have to go. No. Okay. Well, has anybody got any questions for Marcus just now, just before he shoots off? If you do, just unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, yeah, Pete, Pete, coming to you. Hi, Pete. Hi, Marcus. I was interested to know. Um, quarrying different types of stone so i was thinking of uh granite up yeah. north and you know sandstone or limestone uh, i assume granite is a lot harder to quarry because it's a harder stone is that right well you would think wouldn't you except that except that the harder a stone is once you can split it it will it will split it will behave in terms of its split because the force of split is not dissipated into the material somehow. So as long as you use the correct um, method of splitting with any material and you understand and acknowledge that the geology that you are stood in has already dictated where the, where the joints are and bear in mind what you're doing is looking to see where the joints are and creating a line of drill holes or wedges or whatever to be able to join those natural joints up um, then you know the the method of quarrying remains the same and when we look at Aberdeen as a good example if you look at the material in Aberdeen you'll see that there are some highly decorative finishes in that material yeah um, and what that tells you is that although granite is of legendary hardness, it's not that odd. Um, so what I mean by that is that it is workable. And as any material, when any material comes out of a quarry, it is more workable in its early state than it is later on in its life. So sandstones, limestones, uh, igneous stones, uh, granite, you know, whatever, um, are all more easily hewn. It's just about having the right tools and the right understanding of the geology. And that will change from one granite quarry to another as it does from any sedimentary stone quarry to another. Okay, thank you. No problem.
Thanks, Marcus. Any more questions? Okay, I think um, we'll allow you to get off, Marcus. Thanks very much for coming back and. My pleasure. If anybody if anybody wants to email anything in, just send it on. I'll happily answer anything. So. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thanks very much. I'm sorry I've got to go so early. No today. worries. Okay. Take care, Marcus. Cheerio. Bye bye. So, um, hi everyone. I will just get my um, screen up for you. Okay, can everyone see that okay? I'm thinking, hoping. Um, so for those of you who have not met, um, I am Stacey Roundtree. I'm the former building surveyor here at the Scottish Lime Centre Trust. I was the, um, the lead project manager, sort of lead surveyor on um, the Inverkeething Stone and Slate survey. So I've come back now twice to do this. Um, uh, presentation. I will apologize. The last time I did this was about two months ago. So I am maybe a little bit rusty on um, some of the content, but um, I lived and breathed this uh, project. So I think I've probably got it ingrained in my brain. So just to start off with a brief summary of um, what I will run through, it's just a broad summary of our findings, um, some of the maintenance issues, the stone conditions that we um, noted, modern interventions and materials and how they've affected stone, and some of the key issues which are and invariably always are chimneys and gable ends. Throughout this presentation, I will probably touch on many of the things that Roz and Katie will talk in more detail on later on, but it just kind of forms the core of the findings for the survey. So this picture um, basically summarizes our findings in one photo. We found multiple types of stone multiple types of sandstone, and then also um, windstone or dolerite, which you can see the darker stones there. Lots of original lime mortars, including harling. There was also, um, and will always be some modern cement mortars in and around that as well. Um, the ivy, well, uh, extensive vegetation there is a little, um, insight into the lack of maintenance that is found, leading to quite considerable decay and also um, destabilizing stonework. Alterations, as you can see, there's a little um, window or former opening um, in the middle that has been blocked up. Lots of alterations and additions. It's normal in any town for that to um, occur, but sometimes they actually um, can lead to the loss of original character, but also cause some damage um, along the way. Um, but generally, on the whole, um, masonry was actually in quite good condition, um, only let down by a few little areas of um, lack of maintenance again, and um, materials, inappropriate materials used. So like I say, generally, um, there were, quite a few different sandstone types that we found for such a small area to, to sample um, there was there was quite a few that we found again Katie's going to go into more detail in this later on but generally we found four different types of sandstone um, one dolerite or windstone um, which is um, very uh, prevalent in that area these stones have we've since then found them in other areas um, local to uh, the East Nuka Fife. Um, we found in particular more dolerite in other areas. Um, most recently, well, I don't know if it's recent anymore, but um, we found a dolerite in a footbridge, collapsed footbridge um, after the flooding uh, of last year at Abadawa Harbour, which carries Fife Coastal Path. And um, we found it in lots of other areas as well. Some of the sandstones too. The lime mortars that we found um, were largely not on the principal facades. 
um, due to, to the nature of all the commercial properties having um, different frontages. Um, but also because most of the frontages that were um, ashlar or very uh, finely um, bedded, finely jointed masonry. Um, and the lack of maintenance is, is a common issue. It's, it's, it's always an issue in town centres or where there's multi-occupancy um, buildings, um, a mix of residential and commercial. And it's something that we found again and again, um, and that does cause um, quite serious defects in some cases, which we'll kind of touch on in a little bit. But again, on the whole, stone was in quite good condition. It's just the few areas that have um, let some buildings down with a lack of maintenance and, and modern materials. So here's a sort of visual representation of um, of the sampling and the results of those samples. Um, as you can see, the stone types are distributed quite evenly throughout the um, high street, um, but they're sample one and sample two um, types were concentrated at the north end of the high street. This is where the oldest buildings were found and the um, likely similar sandstone types were clustered in that area. There is also a number of, of painted and rendered buildings, which I will touch on to a little bit later and go into more detail on painted facades in a separate presentation later on as well. So it's, it's common in, in town centres for alterations, um, particularly for commercial properties, um, to have, you know, um, amended them, altered them, make them easier to use, make them, um, you know, allow them to accommodate whatever function they have. This curious apparatus, though, was found at the rear of the town hall. Um, which is just adjacent to the Kedora Cafe. And I'm not sure, or, or there was a few people that kind of guessed it the last time, but it's actually a cat ladder um, to allow the owner's cat to get safely to the ground from the top property. Not including the cat ladder, there is also quite a lot of ivy growth, um, probably from the gutter and, and lack of a downpipe in that area. And that's causing some serious issues to the, the masonry. It's actually um, kind of dislodging the masonry at the gutter level and some of the, the um, uh, slates as well, because uh, it pushes up through um, to the slates. Um, so as much as, you know, they've intervened and, and put something in to help a cat, they've actually completely neglected the building and not um, actually removed any of the, the vegetation that's causing some um, issues. So um, this is the Half Crown pub, which is formerly the Royal Hotel. Um, one it's completely rendered and painted um so we you could assume that that would be um in response to the the stone underneath of being of a poorer quality and maybe requiring a bit of extra protection um as was understood historically that some sandstones would need some protection because they were known to um, decay a little bit faster. Um, however, in modern times, using such materials, cement render and um, masonry paints can actually cause further decay um, and isn't actually protecting it at all. Now, if we look at a historic photo of um, the High Street, you can see the Half Crown pub Oh, formerly the Royal Hotel on the far right, um, almost you know unrecognizable. There's a much more traditional um, frontage which has now been infilled, but there is a whitewash finish to that section of the um, hotel or pub. And if we look at an even older picture, 
again to the far right, you can see that the finish is still um, a, a lime wash or possibly a rendered finish. So, you know, these predate, um, uh, you know, they would have been when the buildings were a lot fresher um, and it wasn't necessarily in response to the stone decaying already, but it might have been a known um, method of preventing any um, damage to occur, or it might have just been as a decorative finish because that was a hotel. So we don't always, um, we can't always assume that if a building is now rendered and painted, that it has um, never been rendered or painted before, or because it was in, in response to the stone being of poor quality, it might be an actually okay quality stone. However, using modern materials and modern renders um, of, of um, inappropriate, using inappropriate materials will cause damage. Um, and the materials used historically would have been much more harmonious with the stone. Again, I'll go into that a little bit later and, and um, into the mechanisms of why. So the lime mortars that we found um, are actually quite a good representation of how um, mortar making and um, lime production are developed over time because the older properties ranged from very crude non-hydraulic mortars to then repairing mortars, which were much more sophisticated hydraulic mortars of the industrial era. So those that were produced like um, in Charlestown. So ranging from the assumed oldest, um, which is from the town halls, the top left sample, um, to the Bank Street Salon in the middle top, and the rear of the town hall Harling that was found, um, which is the sample in the top right, and the newest mortar that we found was a hydraulic mortar, um, likely a repairing pointing mortar, which was from the Port Street Venal, um, and that's the bottom sample. You can see generally um, in terms of hardness that the hydraulic sample is, is much more firm, intact, it's got sharper edges, and the older sample is crumbled less intact pieces and um, has, you know, the, the aggregate is um, a little bit less well sorted. So the most recent sample, like I said, from the, the Port Street Venal um, is likely a Charlestown lime. It was, you know, very close and the, the components of the lime look very much like those which were produced at Charlestown. Katie will go into um, more detail about the limestone sources and the limes that were used here, um, but it was a major finding for us um, as we previously weren't, haven't found such well-preserved or such a plethora of lime mortars and in particular harling mortars in a town um, as we have in Inverkeething. And it's, it's really interesting to see the evolution of these mortars. So as Ros was mentioning, um, the proximity of, and availability of, of materials have decided how buildings have been constructed. Historically, that's you know, why we term it vernacular architecture because it's the visual and physical representation of the local materials and also the local weather conditions. Um, so you know, buildings that are built um, here are vastly different from the buildings that are constructed you know, in the, in, in the Hebrides, um, you know, openings are smaller, um, walls are thicker, our, our buildings are, um, don't have to um, withstand such extreme conditions. So a simple rubble building with a lime hall and a clay pantal roof might seem you know, quite aesthetically pleasing. Like this example, um, Thompson's lodging on, on Bank Street, but it's, it's um, actually a very typical Fife building with materials found particularly um, abundant in Fife. 
the more recent copper s lime wash um, finish would also have been fairly traditional. And Inverkeithing being on the coast had an advantage as transport would be easy via sea and raw materials could also be from the sea. So many coastal towns had a plethora or abundance of oyster shells, which were easily burnt um, to produce lime in clamp kilns, which are just basically simple holes in the ground um, uh, with a fire and covered over. There were archeological finds um, just kind of opposite this building on Bank Street, there's a new building, um, 1A to C Bank Street. Um, prior to the construction of that building in 1982, there was an archaeological dig and there were remains or remnants of clam kilns and burnt oyster shells found there and could be likely a source of lime for mortars um, or a similar type of those found um, in the town hall. So maintenance is going to be a big thing to, to talk about. Again, that's why we've got a, a whole section on it that Ros will be discussing later on. Nearly every building survey in every town we've ever done will probably have some item or defect that is attributable to a lack of maintenance. It's always a major finding of a survey and, and definitely a stone survey. It was uh, the core of the stone survey that we did in Cooper as well. And we'll probably repeat it again and again um, because it is just something that gets forgotten about. Cleaning gutters isn't glamorous, but it does cost a lot when you don't do it and, you, and things get left because repointing or um, replacing stone in relative costs of, of cleaning gutters is, is quite a lot. So here, um, just a few examples. These are really just some of the examples of buddleia growth in particular or extensive vegetation growth. The, um, the, the picture in the top right corner is the Queen's Hotel. And I think it's been cleared now. I actually haven't been back to Inverkeithing for a while. Um, but that, that skew cope was actually completely dislodged by that quite extensive and quite large buddleia growth. And that is actually posing a safety risk. It's not just, um, you know, a fabric um, issue where you know, dampness and, and water penetration can cause issues. That's actually a safety risk. And quite a lot of times um, maintenance can lead to loose masonry and, and, and that's a very common um, and topical thing at the moment, um, particularly with lots of um, decorative items and, and such being loose in more formal buildings in you know, the cities and things, but it's, it's something that needs to be thought about because it's not just causing issues to the fabric of the building, it's actually, because that's on, a, on the main sort of pavement area um, and could be quite a big issue. Again, the, the top, uh, sorry, the bottom right, that's the um, area at the rear of the town hall. Um, again, unassuming bit of um, vegetation, but that route's quite well established and it's completely dislodged all the slates in that area. And these, there could be um, quite extensive dampness internally. So, the previous picture of the, the um, Queen's Hotel was a little bit earlier in the year. Um, and this was it in the summer where it had really taken hold. And if you, if you do just leave things, they will get bigger um, and tend to spread. This um, is, the, is Mary's Meals on the High Street. A, quite a few defects found with this building. Um, so the gutter here, I, I don't know if you can see it sort of stops short um, and the skew kind of funnels water past the gutter, which is just allowing it to kind of 
completely spray and cover the end of the building. The gutter itself and the hopper are choked um, because of debris and vegetation growth. Um, and really the, the sandstone here, the sandstone coins are the ones suffering because they're much more porous. The dolerite won't accept any of the water. And so it's all being funneled into the sandstone and the mortar joints. And it's really just accelerating um, weathering to those areas. There's extensive vegetation growth in the mortar joints themselves, a lot of algae and, and, and um, moss as well on the sandstone. And that will just be continuing to keep that area saturated as well. So long past once the water has actually stopped, the, the water will just be retained there. So a simple gutter fix in this case could actually completely avoid all of those issues and just simply clearing the gutter and hopper um, would also avoid all those issues. So simple things can really help in the long term. So this is um, coming to maybe a little bit more of the alteration side of things. So this is Thistle Locks on the High Street. Um, we use this as a sample building because of the stone type. This is sample type SS4. It also has several issues which would require repairs and therefore we thought a stone core wouldn't, um, would be justified. Looking at this gable end, um, I wonder if anybody can spot something that's odd with it because it's missing chimneys. It has half a stack and no pots. So the masonry to the, the chimney stack has been removed, the pots have been removed and it has purely just been covered with cement. Now there's no ventilation to that, to the existing flues and as you can see at the top, the masonry is really suffering from that. There is quite a bit of stone decay there. The joints are, are um, filled with cement mortar, which is also not really helping things. And it's just visually more wet than any of the other masonry um, compared to the front and the other opposing gable end. The, Masonry at, at Flues is thinner, and so it's much easier to saturate, and it's also much easier for water to come and go. So lots more um, wetting and drying cycles, which is why um, gable ends or, or chimney flues where gable end, on gable ends is, is where damage is usually concentrated. And capping off chimneys and not allowing any ventilation is, is really just making things worse. At the ground level, you can see there's, a, there's an almost complete tide line where splash back from the road and de-icing salts is causing some issues here. There's quite extensive decay here. The stone has almost turned to dust. Um, and I'll just show you in the next slide. This is, is kind of the general condition of the stone at that sort of base level. The mortar joints here are basically non-existent. You can probably stick a whole ruler in there and, and it would disappear. This stone here is maybe a little bit difficult to tell, but it is quite severely decayed, probably about an inch or two back from the face of where it should be. And generally this stone is actually um, you're not a bad stone. So it's actually been forced to do quite a lot and it's just not coping. So when you ask stone to do things um, that it's not uh, able to do, this is this is kind of what happens. But if we look after stone and protect it and look and, you know, fill the joints, um, make sure there's, you know, not too much splashback, then we could save it. This this area is a little bit difficult because it's very close to a road and a lot of the town centers, that's gonna be the same issue. However, areas like this um, would be much easier to look after. This is the gable end of Papa Jaffa's on the high street. So there's been some alterations here with the chimney. Likely this is not the original line 
um, of the chimney and this area has been rebuilt in brick. There are local bricks and it you know, could be possible that that was made with local brick. However, the render is quite applied quite thinly um, and it doesn't really appear to have um, much of a key. Um, and bricks are much um, less porous than masonry. Even um, uh, older bricks would be a little bit less porous than masonry and modern bricks are basically impervious. So if we're you know, using brick alongside quite porous sandstone and covering it with a cement render, then all we're doing is just funneling water into all these areas of sandstone. And you can just about see, but the, 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 the sandstone um, underneath is, is really suffering. And there's clearly been some issues here which have been patched up with cement and obviously not doesn't look very good, but is just not going to help the, the, the sandstone. It's actually going to make it worse. And um, it's a shame because this fabric could then be potentially completely lost. Um, when if you know just covered that in a lime and possibly just lime washed it would probably be in a much better situation. So we found a few curious things, um, interesting buildings, details, little oddities such as the cat ramp um, and lots of lime in Inverkeithing. Many are well documented such as Forda's Lodging, Providence House, Thompson's Lodging and the like. But we thought that some of these little details were extra special, such as the stained glass um, and Lindsay and Gilmore, the Cross Pharmacy. Um, it's a turn of the century building and there is uh, actually quite a lot of it, but it's completely covered up by the signage. So you, the only way to see it is if you go inside. And I completely understand why they would want to cover it up and protect it, but it's a shame that we can't see it um, as it is. So that's the frontage and behind all of that is all stained glass. So here we have Wilson Solicitors on the high sheet, which is actually the National Bank of Scotland's first branch, um, or actually technically the second branch in Inverkeithing. It was built in 1934. The newer building that this building replaced was actually dated to 1911. The National Bank of Scotland decided that Inverkeithing was actually a hub following the opening of the fourth rail bridge and was important enough for it to have its first branch placed in Inverkeithing. So the second building here is, is um, of such importance that they used imported limestone panels, which is an expensive material and also highly decorative. Here we can see the limestone panel. You can see fossils very clearly, very easily in it. Um, and are still actually in, in quite good condition considering the various fixings and, and splashback and the like. But a beautiful building and really just shows how important Inverkeithing was um, in terms of transport and, and where things linked up. There was a surprising number, number of tenements and quite well formed and formal formally built tenements. Um, I think if you looked at this, you wouldn't think twice to say that's possibly in Glasgow, but it's not. Um, it's built in Locker Briggs or similar red sandstone. We didn't sample this building because it was um, out with the area that was used for sampling, but it's very formally built, ash the frontage, um, nice squared course on sewn on the sides and on the back the more local blonde sandstone um i quite think i think the patination of the stone looks quite pleasing although some might disagree but very 
lovely um, tenement. Another one on Hope Street with more commercial properties um, on the ground floor. Again, wouldn't look out of place in Edinburgh, very formally built, Ashler, decorative skew putts and the like, um, making up quite a lot of the housing um, in, in Vicky's at the time. And this is it from the rear. So again, a use of the local materials, dolerite mix of um, the sandstones and using red sandstone and again, um, as decorative dressings to the openings. Again, using the complete palette of materials available. So brick here used, it was produced locally and blonde sandstone, another tenement again on Roman Road. This is some, um, Possibly my favorite building in, in Verkeething. Um, the traffic light spoils this photo a little bit, but there's nothing I can do about that. Um, there's a few reasons why I like this building. It's possibly the least altered in terms of the masonry, um, but more specifically the windows. The, I think this might be the only building particularly on the high street that still has all its original timber sash and case windows, including the curved dormer sliders. The roof is original, an original Scot Scottish slate roof, and is actually in, in pretty good condition. There's a possibility it could have been thatched originally, however, um, as there are some thack stains, um, which have slight projections um, at the bottom, of the base of the chimneys. Um, and it's quite a deep skew, which might have um, indicated that this might have been thatched originally. However, the, the pots are no more. It's been capped off with no ventilation again. So in that aspect, not doing so well. The stonework itself is in, in pretty good condition. However, um, as Marcus was saying, some of the, the bedding for, for stonework around windows um, isn't always is possible because of how the stone comes out to quarry. And here there is a little bit of um, edge bedding, which is basically the stone is kind of delaminating from itself. At the ground floor, the, the, the commercial property um, possibly follows a little bit of what might have been a traditional frontage. Obviously this is um, not traditional and very modern. However, the painted finish that was here previously was lime wash. It has been removed um, quite recently, not sure when, but there is lots of remnants of lime wash on this section of the building. Um, many, many layers of lime wash. You can actually see them at the edges. Um, and so it's historic that this section of the building would have been lime washed again possibly as, as protection from uh you know just uh wear and tear um or to just keep it looking a bit nicer if it was a shop quite a simple building bonnie particularly these dormers an unusual feature and very unusual to find them in their original state, more or less. And I will, um, I'll finish on this slide, which is a cobble uh, section with some cobble sets found behind the half crown. Um, we probably spent a bit too much time there actually looking at the stonework and sampling the mortar, which the people living there probably thought was very weird, but we're quite used to that. And, um, I don't think it would be the same if people didn't think that we were completely mad, um, which we are. So that's me. And I think we... Okay, uh, welcome back everybody. Um, we're gonna focus on, um, uh, uh, in this first part of the second half on uh, repairs and maintenance, um, what you should be thinking about 
um, particularly what not to do and of course what to do with what materials um, and, and when you should ideally carry out uh, repairs and maintenance. So we can see here expanding foam used to bond natural stone masonry. Um, this will almost certainly trap moisture behind it and cause problems. It isn't a like for like repair and totally inappropriate. Again, overly hard, dense cement mortar has been used here to repoint this red sandstone wall. Um, not only does it look awful, um, but it's now placed stresses on the sandstone masonry units. So all the wetting and drying is concentrated in the weaker material, which in this case is the sandstone masonry units, leading to its accelerated decay. And I suppose this is a bit of an extreme example, but here we have, um, this is in Devon of all places. Um, it's just a good, I, a good example of an extreme event, I suppose. Um, so this is a, a clay and field stone wall uh, constructed um, uh, with uh, wooden shuttering uh, to reach the height of the wall head. And then some bright spark thought it would be a good idea to cement render over it and not maintain it. And so water has been dripping, saturating the, the clay binder such that it's reached its wet plastic limits and then it slumps leading to the collapse of the wall. So when repointing re a wall, and that's renewing failed, perished or open joints, um, it's a good idea to try and match the mortar in terms of color and texture, um, because um, although this has been uh, repointed in lime mortar, clearly it sticks out like a, a sore thumb. So better choice of binder and sand um, would have alleviated that. And you could just, even just have you know, plain ugly. Um, and if the person doing this work had actually read the wall properly, they would have seen the remnants of original lime harling and lime wash over the faces of the rubble stones. You can see it all over the place. Um, so that's just not understanding what you're trying to do. And inappropriate use of gloss paint here over natural sandstone has um, trapped moisture, resulting in the damage to the stone, turning it to a sandy, friable state, simply because it can't, uh, it's trapping moisture um, all the time. And most modern film forming paints um, will crack and peel and look tatty very quickly because um, UV V rays, rays from the sun um, actually deteriorate it. Um, on the other hand, if you use lime-based washes and paints, they grace, uh, age more gracefully through weathering and UV rays do not affect lime-based finishes. So this wall has been clashed up with a grey cement mortar leading to the accelerated decay of the masonry, as you can see. Um, and this is just one small section of a stable courtyard um, uh, formation that we were involved in. And there are areas where um, uh, the, fin the original finishes are totally intact and no repair requirements whatsoever. Um, so in our um, uh, 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 in our approach to um, um, organising repairs, we're going to try and match that mortar in terms of colour and texture, and that's where our mortar analysis process can be very um, useful. Here we see towards the top of the roof, um, um, we've got a non-matching natural slate laid to regular courses. It's probably um, uh, uh, Welsh slate, whereas the original slates below uh, are highland boundary slates laid to random diminishing courses. So they're larger at the bottom and they get smaller as they go up towards the top of the roof. Um, and so the replacement with thinner, more regularly sized slates, um, which don't match in terms of color or texture, um, uh, spoils the character of the roof. We have our offending expanding foam again. We do hope this is a temporary repair. And, you know, uh, to my mind and lots of other people in building conservation, PVC windows and doors in an 1896 stone tenement just doesn't sit very well um, at all. 
and the building next door has original 1896 uh, windows, sliding session case windows, kept in good repair with regular maintenance. And yeah, what on earth is going on here? Um, we hope it's a temporary repair, but um, let's hope somebody formulates something a bit more robust uh, going forward. And again, um, the use of overly hard, dense, impervious mortars uh, lined out to make it look like rubble masonry, but um, it's not kidding anyone, I don't think. And so inappropriate repairs or interventions or lack of repairs can all cause um, problems with masonry decay and fabric of buildings. And can lead to more expensive repairs later on um, in order to rectify the issues of stone decay, dampness, or worse, outbreaks of um, dry or wet rot in timbers. And they can seriously reduce the value of our traditional buildings, uh, making them very often difficult to sell. They can also threaten the health and safety of a traditional building's occupants or people walking past, which is obviously um, uh, a very important issue. And I think if you bear in mind a stitch in time saves nine, the sooner an appropriate repair is made, then this, this prevents a much more expensive um, repair bill further down the line. And if we have a look at um, this seesaw hypothesis, there's a, there's a balance to be made here. So you might have a high initial repair cost, but in the long term, you'll have low maintenance costs. But if you do a cheap repair uh, initially, you end up with higher long-term maintenance costs. So it's um, horses for courses. Uh, and we've already learned that traditional buildings took a relatively long time to construct, utilizing many man hours in extracting stone, slate, timber, burning limestone to make building lime, and then assembling them as solid walled buildings. Um, but the materials used are usually locally sourced and therefore transported over shorter distances. And, you know, testament, these buildings are extremely durable and can last for hundreds of years. In comparison, modern buildings have relatively short construction times aimed, aimed at constructing buildings at a fast pace, utilising manufactured materials or important, imported materials with a relatively high embodied energy. And design lifespans tend not to exceed uh, between 40 to 60 years. Uh, with individual systems or components expected to be fully replaced at least once or several times within that period. And in terms of life cycle costing, replacing elements of a building at short intervals, even at a lower cost each time, is more expensive on average than spending more money on durable materials which have a longer lifespan of 50 plus years. Um, so modern construction tends to adopt an almost disposable method of building in contrast to traditional buildings, which outlast most modern buildings by several hundred years. And so if we try and repair and maintain our existing traditional building stock using um, materials that have less embodied energy, um, that's uh, more for a, a sustainable future. I've got a wee example here of um, the purchase of rainwater goods. So it's a typical shopping basket, basket of components um, in different materials. It, does, it doesn't include the installation costs, um, I should um, point out. So for cast iron, we've got £834.26, UPVC, a whole lot cheaper, £151.80, and you'll see the uh, equivalents in alumin, uh, aluminium and copper. But if we look at um, over a 100-year life um, of a UK dwelling, um, for cast iron, you would only need one installation cycle, assuming you repair and maintain um, uh, the rainwater goods. You might have up to eight installations for PVC downpipes and gutters, um, four for aluminium and one for copper. So you can see that cast iron um, um, being the original um, and traditional uh, um, material for rainwater goods, um, certainly in Scotland, copper uh, is not um, found very often um, that uh, outshines it, as long as you um, maintain your cast iron rainwater goods by regularly painting them and ensuring that the joins um, are 
sealed in uh, gutters, for example. So <clears throat> in order to establish a maintenance program, um, we should work on the basis that prevention is always better than cure. Um, for example, clearing out debris out of gutters on a regular basis, particularly after leaves have fallen in the autumn. Uh, and we can prevent further uh, problems by fitting leaf guards, which stop um, uh, any blockages. Um, and regular inspections and cyclical repair strategies will always uh, come out uh, trumps. So we want to retain as many original elements as we can. Uh, we might need to replace damaged sections, but we should replace these on a like-for-like -like basis. Um, and we should follow conservation ethics and principles, but also consider the practicalities of carrying out repairs. So in general, in, in Bikithing, we found a lack of maintenance um, and repair, particularly of rainwater goods, with large volumes of vegetation growth um, along roof lines and in rainwater goods, and um, decaying masonry, particularly uh, in chimneys, unused chimneys, as Stacey had pointed out um, in her presentation before. Um, so disuse, disused chimneys are a real problem because they don't really get a chance to dry out because they're no longer used for solid fuel fires. And it's really, really important that they are vented top and bottom to allow for air circulation, um, as, as Stacey had also pointed out. Um, so other sort of um, things to consider if um, buildings you're dealing with are in multiple ownership, um, that can add to the problem of organising repairs but a stitch in time saves nine. Don't let your building get to the point where seriously expensive repairs are incurred when these could have been prevented with ongoing maintenance. And we all know what happens if we don't regularly service our cars. So remedial steps in order of priority, removal of vegetation growth is paramount. Um, any dirt and debris from masonry and rainwater goods, um, if you're clearing out gutters, don't allow the dirt and debris to enter downpipes, as that might cause blockages. If the downpipes are blocked, there are usually access points to allow for rotting irons to clear debris. <coughs> the vertical sections of downpipes aren't sealed. They simply fit into each other and can be parted fairly easily. Sometimes it might uh, require the redesigning of the placement and size of rainwater goods um, particularly as we've been suffering from great deluges of, um, of, of rainfall of um, the last 10 to 15 years. Um, so that's something we're thinking about. And that could um, mean you'd have to apply for listed building consent because it would be a material alteration to a, a listed building. Um, for rainwater goods, you can test the soundness of um, uh, downpipes with a metal instrument and it should ring if it is sound. If you um, hit it with a metal instrument and a dull thud sound comes out, it probably means it's cracked somewhere and will, uh, will require replacement in cast iron to match. Um, and rainwater goods do require to be painted periodically, ensuring all uh, uh, rust is removed um, um, before you do so. Um, if you've got new cast iron sections, they will require two coats of a zinc-based primer, one coat of micaceous iron oxide, followed by two coats of the, your chosen color of uh, gloss paint. Um, of course, if you are changing the color of your um, cast iron rainwater goods, that, that might require listed building consent. Um, leaf guards, as I mentioned before, can be fitted to gutters and wire balloons can be placed over the tops of downpipes to help prevent blockages. And there's all sorts of masonry uh, decay issues we might come across. So you can see there's lots of salts um, efflorescing at the base of the walls here. Uh, that could be due to lots of different things, road splash, de-icing salts, um, or, and uh, also the presence of cement pointing, which doesn't help um, the longevity of um, the sandstone masonry in this case. And water is normally the agent of decay so we can see that um, in this cornice, overhanging cornice, um, we've got vertical or per perpendicular joints, some of which may be open, allowing water uncontrolled access and compromising the masonry beneath. 
And again, um, uh, as relates to chimneys, um, because these uh, gable ends will have maybe four or six um, flue paths in them, it's a very thin piece of masonry, um, relatively speaking. Um, and we can see we've got cracks here, which could be from um, having open fires in the past, um, um, decaying um, sandstone from flue gases uh, in particular. So carefully removing damaged cement point, damaging cement pointing or coatings from stone substrates um, and replacing them with more forgiving lime mortars um, should be one of our aims. And where stone is structurally compromised, we should re be replacing that with a compatible sandstone. So your building in Inverkeething may have been matched as part of our survey. So get in touch with us and we can check it out for you. And we've got new line pointing next to old here, uh, quite seamless, um, not in your face, well-chosen sand, well-chosen line binder, uh, making a reasonably seamless repair. Um, the loss of chimneys here, um, for example, you can see this has been built back up um, in concrete block, um, and so nobody can use the chimney ever again. Um, and we still have this issue of remnants of cement render um, compromising the masonry beneath. <clears throat> Some chimneys can be very unstable. They might look okay from um, just looking up at them, but once you um, have a scaffold up there, um, <clears throat> you can quite very quickly find um, the sandstone once it becomes dislodged, just falls to um, sand basically. And plus it doesn't help with all these um, TV aerials um, attached to chimneys um, with the diff different expansive forces of metal expanding, contracting can also compromise uh, natural stone masonry. <coughs> So you should never use ordinary Portland cement in connection with any flue masonry or below ground works. Um, and for the most part on traditional buildings, try and use natural or formulated hydraulic line mortars that are weaker than the masonry units that you're dealing with. In Inverkeithing, generally the condition of the slated roofs was good with only a few slipped or missing slates, which should be replaced with like for like materials as a matter of urgency. Obviously, your roof is your first line of defence from the weather. Um, and I mentioned earlier, earlier that typical traditional Scottish slate roofs are laid with slates in random diminishing courses, which give them a particularly pleasing character when compared to modern tally slating, as the next two slides will illustrate. So that's your random diminishing courses, interesting tex texture, uh, textural effect, and then your tally slating, which is a bit more like Lego. Um, so in, in terms of roof repairs, ideally you would try and use reclaimed secondhand Scottish slates with a matching colour and texture and thickness and size, um, crucially laid by a skilled roofing contractor with a good understanding of traditional Scottish roofing practice. Um, and this harks back again to um, modern apprenticeships. Um, uh, are really geared towards modern construction techniques, which would be tally slating rather than random diminishing courses. Um, so be vigilant. So particularly after spells of, of particularly poor weather, give your building a once over just to check for any damage. Um, a slipped or a missing slate can do far more damage relative to the size of the repair area. Clean out your gutters at least twice a year uh, many window cleaners offer this service, by the way. Um, check your roof from the ground using binoculars or else access hatches on the roof if you, uh, if you have those um, and attend to any slipped, broken or missing slates as a, a real priority. So when we're looking at buildings and surveying them, we'll prioritise what we think um, requires um, uh, in terms of repair as emergency works which is basically work um, requiring immediate attention in order to keep the building wind and water tight. Urgent works, uh, work that should be undertaken within um, uh, the next 12 months to, uh, to prevent further deterioration of the building fabric. Priority three, necessary works, um, less urgent, but will then nevertheless still have to be undertaken within the next two to five years in order to prevent more serious problems. 
and then desirable repairs, work that would enhance or improve a building's appearance while safeguarding um, original features. So developing a, a, a planned maintenance programme um, with defects recorded and the priority given to essential repair work, um, you can then formulate um, a maintenance programme um, which provides a clear indication of proposed repairs and the order in which they should be carried out. Um, and this allows the repairs to be broken down into manageable stages um, and provides property owners with an estimated budget for forthcoming work. Planned building maintenance ensures a suitable timescale is given to repair works and reduces the need for costly unplanned emergency works. And so this is, uh, this is a good example of a maintenance programme um, when you should be cleaning gutters, um, doing roof repairs, ideally in the summer, but clearly if it's an emergency repair, that's got to be any time of the year. Um, external painting, ideally in the summer months, and lime mortar work between April and September. Although the reality is, of course, um, that you know uh, masonry contracting is 365 days a year, and so precautions need to be taken uh, to ensure lime mortars are cured adequately um, before they are um, exposed to freezing conditions, for example. So, how to organise regular maintenance work? If you if you own part of a tenement, you will need the cooperation of other uh, building owners. Um, um, you should form a committee and a sink fund, or alternatively appoint a surveying practice to undertake work on your behalf. Uh, these are also called factors um, uh, sometimes, and get the commitment of other residents. Um, if you go to, I should have updated this, I apologize, um, under one roof um, website, you'll find lots of information um, and, and a really good resource for, for building owners. So just to recap, um, are you going to need listed building consent? That's only if you're going to materially change the outside appearance of your building. Um, applications are free of charge, but they do actually require quite a detailed um, information. Um, so consult an appropriately experienced building professional to submit um, an application on your behalf. In terms of procuring successful repairs, always appoint a reputable company, ask them to demonstrate their competence, ask them to carry out a sample panel of finished work for your approval. Um, and in an ideal world, ask for a ceiling price which can't be surpassed. And so everybody knows where they are. Um, <clears throat> agree payment terms up front and ask for photographic evidence of work progress to accompany um, valuations. And um, enjoy the fruits of your organizational skills and having a weatherproof building that looks good to boot. Sorry, I kind of ran over time a wee bit there. Um, so um, I'm going to um, hand over to, to um, Katie, Dr. Katie Strang, who's our building materials analyst here at the Scottish Lime Centre. And take it away, Katie. Hello everyone, I'm just going to share my screen with you. Um, so today I'm going to be talking in more detail about the actual analysis side of things and a little bit about the sort of local geology to Inverkeething and why that's so important and why it's important to understand these things when you think about repairs and conservation. Um, so I'll do a quick overview of the actual analysis and what that entails, the kind of analysis, and then I'll go into detail about the Inverkeithing stuff. Um, on this screen here, we have two images. The one on the left hand side is a thin section image of a mortar sample, and on the right hand side is a thin section image of a stone sample. And here is a picture of the type of equipment we use to look at these. Now, a thin section um, is what we use in petrographic analysis. And that is the type of analysis that focuses on really detailed descriptions of the fabric of rocks and also of mortar as well. 
And to make a thin section, and what we actually do is the sample is cut and sliced and then polished, and that is polished to 30 microns, which is like 0.03 millimeters, so half the thickness of a strand of your hair. And that means that when that's under a polarizing microscope, we can shine light through that sample. And different minerals in rocks and in mortar have different optical properties. And it's these properties that tell us more about the, the nature, so the mineralogy, what type of material is in there. But we can also find out things about the structure of the binder, for example, in the mortar. And it's a really important uh, process. And it's one of the things that's used in stone matching. So if you need to get stone matching done on your building, um, you will need to have petrographic analysis undertaken to get a stone match. So why do we actually do this? Why is it important? Um, as an example, I've put here this geological map from the British Geological Survey, and it's shown mostly the sort of central belt area because that's where we're based and that's where Inverkeething is. But when you look at this map, you can just see a whole array of colors and the geology of Scotland is very unique for a country of its size. Essentially, we have a really, really varied geology. And um, when you go to the Northwest of Scotland, we have some of the oldest rocks in the world. Um, here in the central belt we are mostly underlain by carboniferous rocks um, and those rocks were deposited when Scotland lay closer to the equator between about 350 and 300 million years ago. So the conditions that formed those rocks were very very different but it was also uh, it was very variable so at the same time there was lots of other things going on there was big river systems uh, there was volcanoes and all these things influenced the underlying geology. And ultimately as well, these things do influence where settlements are. So people would have gone to where there is local resources. And you can see it quite nicely when you look at the, for example, the coal fields of Fife and where the current settlements are and really good link between your landscape and your geology and settlements. But one of the reasons that it's important to undertake analysis is that over the, the last couple of decades, we have seen a revival in Scotland in the use of stone in construction, in both in new buildings and in repairs. But this has increased uh, demands for up-to-date information on the types of stone types that we have, which are currently available, and which ones are local, and also the distinctive features and properties. And because of this renewed interest, um, part of it's to do with environmental concerns and the carbon footprints involved with producing and transporting large amounts of rock from other countries and bringing them to within the UK. Um, so that is why there's been a, a lot of focus and research gone into to looking at native Scottish stone and how that can be used in conservation. And proper conservation should start with the appropriate analysis and diagnosis and understanding of what's actually causing deterioration of these materials. Because if you don't understand why it's happening in the first place, there's not really any point to fix it, because it's very likely that it's just going to keep continuing. Um, and the analysis of stone in particular should be carried out on building stone, which has a low degree of weathering. So um, you'll have noticed when Ros and Stacey have talked about some of the issues, which I'll go into as well that we see with stone um, a lot of that is due to the to the weathering of the building stone and that's just a natural thing that happens to to all rocks um, and in the context of a building it's important to look at a stone with a low degree of weathering or, or alteration because that will be most similar to what the original stone type was and it will make the best stone match and um, it's just important for uh, following the principles for safeguarding the building. Um, you also don't want to be taking a core from somewhere that's really obvious or where you're not going to be replacing that material. Um, and yeah, we, it, the, we have to ensure that the replacement stone will have the best chance of success. So sometimes you want that to be slightly um, sacrificial to the, the stone that's there, but there's a lot of different things to consider when you look at a build and it's not just the isolated stone, you need to think about the mortar and any other materials that have been used. And um, this image here shows you a, a nice example of what happens to weather with uh, stone weathering. And this is face bedded, like was talked about earlier. And this is 
a very, very common stone around this part of Fife, particularly in Inverkeething. And this stone was formed um, by a big, huge river system, which would have been similar in size to the current at Amazon River. And when you think about the, the context of that and the environment, as you've got big river systems coming in and depositing down the sediment, there is a lot of variability. It's not like it's a big, flat plain where everything is uniform across there. And what we've noticed in more recent times uh, with the increase of pollution from cars and things, we're noticing a lot more things like on stone surfaces uh, due to sulfate attack, which is normally when it reacts with minerals within the stone and that atmospheric pollution. And you get things like a gypsum crust forming and commonly iron oxides can start leaching. In this case on this stone, um, the way it weathers, even though it looks very beautiful, um, this is really not what you want your stone to be doing. And the sort of darker layers that you can see there are softer clay and carbon rich material. So those layers are softer than the rest of the sandstone, which means they will preferentially weather. It means they weather faster. And once that starts happening, it can be quite hard to stop that. Um, but as I've mentioned, it's important to, to consider that the building in the context of the wider picture. So it's not just the stone on its own. You've got your mortar, um, your bricks, lay, any other materials that have been used, but also in the context of what the building's currently been used for, how exposed it is, loads of things to, to consider in that. But it is important that you understand these natural materials and where they were sourced from just to make the best sort of the best educated guess at how you can uh, repair that building and help it last for the long term. Um, but this is an example from Inverkeething to go into sort of some of the things that we, we saw there. So these have already been touched on. I'll go into a bit more about um, sort of the geology and, and why these things happen. Um, you can see here there is some really bad scaling going on with the stone and there is also some cement pointing there and you can see this dark crust. And here, um, this was just causing so many problems. There were various, the various things in this image that were causing the issues. But one of the things was inappropriate repairs and not understanding the materials. So if you're going to put cement on top of a soft sandstone, um, it's never going to be good because all your moisture is going to get trapped in there. And the materials that are within cement also leach as well, and that can form sulfate attack on your sandstone as well and cause um, gypsum crusts and other things to form. And here we have another image of one of these sort of gypsum crusts where you can see this, this really dark staining on there. Now, when you have this, it's, it's careful to think about whether you want to, to remove these to consider how far the decay is going on within the stone, which is why it's important to do sampling of these. If you can understand the, the mineralogy, so what the stone is composed of, you can start to understand a little bit how that stone's going to behave um, when it's exposed to the, to the elements. And um, on the right hand side, you see a picture where there's a lot of flaking going on there and there is um, and just an incredible amount of things like salt crystallising on the surface, um, which can be a big problem when you are next to busy roads where there is a lot of de-icing salt and um, that can get into your the pores of your stone and cause serious issues. And here's another example where you can see some staining and um, these sort of white patches here are very likely salts that are crystallizing out on the surface of the stone. Um, and that's you just don't want this to, to happen. I mean, it's good that they're coming out, but it, in the case of this, um, we could see that the, the deterioration of the top layer of stone, it, it extended quite deep. It was about five millimeters in this case, um, which is not ideal. And here you can see some um, cement pointing where you could literally fit that pen in those holes and you would have been able to pull this off with your hands. And if you look here, you can see these sort of stripes in the rock. Now, these are actually those carbon rich, darker layers that you saw previously in the image of the really weathered, except this stone is in the other way. And you can see where you are getting preferential weathering where, um, because obviously it's in contact with this hard cement and this is a very soft stone, particularly in these corners where more water is going to flow or get trapped, you end up with this decay. And once this starts happening, the stone, it literally just turns back to sand because you lose any of the, the, 
the cementing component to your sandstone and um, ultimately that is not what you want to happen it takes millions of years for sandstone to form but it can turn back to sand uh, very very quickly um, it's particularly in in the context of a building so I'm going to go into some more detail now about the actual geology of Inverkeething and what we found there in the analysis. So here's the, the geological map again, um, showing you the central belt. And this is an old geological map. Um, this is a geological survey of Scotland, one inch to the mile. And the green area, which is around Inverkeething and where you can see the, the original fourth bridge was built, um, this is a type of rock called windstone or dolerite, which is an igneous rock. Um, now, this is quite important in context of why the, the bridge was built there for a start is because of the, the underlying bedrock. This stuff is a lot harder than sandstone and from an engineering and geoengineering perspective and um, large structures and um, you, you prefer to build them on material like this when you know the underlying bedrock and um, it was quite extensive these deposits these igneous deposits are known as igneous intrusions and they normally formed by um, magma under the surface intruding into these layers of sediment and this was all happening around about 300 million years ago or so and windstone um, is well documented to have been a very important resource around the Inverkeething area. Um, there's a lot of old quarries around there. And when you look at the old um, transactions and things, there's a lot of documentation about how well regarded these were, because a lot of the windstone quarries are composed of columnar basalt. Now, I don't know if anybody's heard of the Giant's Causeway. In Ireland, it's a very famous geological site. It's similar to that. I'll show you a wee picture of what I mean in a second. But the reason that they really um, loved this stuff was because it was very easy to extract from the quarry. And because it was so hard, um, it was just very easy to cut and they could get a really nice flat surface on it. And the article here is talking about Crook's Quarry, um, which has various different spellings but it's um, situated just south of the conservation area and it's um, stone from this has been used widely and um, it's been exported it's been used for paving down in London but also has been exported all over the world as well. Now this is a picture of this is not Crook's quarry but this is from the same age of a volcanic intrusion from your Crocodi and you can see these huge big columnar basalt joints and this current quarry is not blasted for, used for building stone, it's blasted for road aggregate, and that is because of the, the nature of dolerite. Um, you may, windstone is the term that's normally used in terms of conservation when you're talking about it in a building, but windstone as a term just really means any dark, hard, crystalline rock. So the difference between um, your sandstone and your igneous rock like this is mainly due to the formation of it. So because an igneous rock forms from hot molten rock, it has time to cool slowly or cool quickly and it will grow crystals. Whereas with a sandstone, it's made up of lots and lots of different particles which later become cemented together, meaning that it has a lot more uh, porosity within. But this is, this is what Crook's Quarry would have looked like um, back in the day, these huge, huge, big uh, columnar joints. It would have been a pretty impressive place to go. Um, and you can see here on this old map, the old Ordnance Survey map, there is lots of windstone quarries were documented throughout history um, in, around Inverkeething and also around the, the Crooks area. And these essentially would have all been exploiting this one um, igneous deposit, but there is variabilities within these deposits as well. And here is another couple, as you can see, um, around about the conservation area and the actual uh, this part of Inverkeith and the High Street and everything itself is built on top of one of these intrusions. Um, and that was probably done because it was a good place of a, a strategic place to, to have a town or settlement. So what we did was we took a sample of windstone from Inverkeething and that was from one of the boundary walls and we got a thin section made and that sample is on the left there and you can see these sort of lath shaped minerals or crystals in thin section and um, these are types of feldspar minerals and there's lots of other things like chlorite which is what gives the stone this like greenish tinge in hand specimen this is a picture of it down here um, and on the right hand side is a sample from 
from uh, the old quarry itself. So even though there are slight differences in the grain size, um, the, the mineralogy, the type of minerals we're finding, uh, very, very similar, very likely sourced from the same deposit. Um, the reason and the variation of the mineral sizes is to do with where in the quarry you're exploiting this material and it's to do with just the, the geology of it. Some areas of the stone, if it's cooled a lot slower, has time to grow bigger crystals. So the one on the right hand side, it's likely that this was somewhere in the intrusion where it was hot for longer and it just means that it's had this slightly more time to form this crystal structure. But overall, because these rocks are very, very crystalline, there is relatively low porosity and permeability. So these thin sections have been impregnated with a blue resin, and you'll see that nicely in the sandstone thin sections. But in this, you, you can't actually see any of that blue resin at all, really, unless there's fractures within the stone. And that is just because of the interlocking nature of these crystals. So I'm going to go on to sandstone now, um, because as well as the windstone, um, we know that there was a lot of sandstone nearby. Now, this the sandstone is a very, very popular stone throughout the central belt. And you'll notice, um, for example, the red sandstone, which is more common in the west of Scotland. Um, but we have a lot of blonde sandstones, white sandstones, um, very, very beautiful variety that we have here. But we identified four main types of sandstone throughout Inverkeething. And these are represented, representative of the Carboniferous formations that outcrop in Fife and other parts of the Midland Valley of Scotland. And um, this is a, another part from the book which tells you a little bit about the, um, the quarry, the sandstone quarry. And here they're saying that the quarry is level free and the stones are uh, conveyed in one horse wagons to the ship side. So this is one of the things about the local resources is the fact that things were able to be able to they were there locally and they weren't able to be, be transported before the sort of railways and things came into force. Um, but the, the quarries for these, the sandstone quarries, a lot of the time in the central belt were actually exploited and used as rubble if they were of a, a poorer quality. And this is the map that shows the distribution of the different stone types throughout Inverkeething. And you can see that the sort of dark ones here show where they've been rendered or painted. And then the color key just shows you the um, availability. So we noticed that towards the south side of the conservation area, there was more of a concentration of the stone type four, which is the most, I would say the poorest in quality of the stones that we looked at. Um, and I'll show you a bit more about that as well. So sandstone type one is considered to be the most common throughout in Brookheathing and it displays a really wide range of qualities and properties. And that is all to do with the sort of depositional environment like I discussed before and to do with the decay features and where it has been within the building as well. And it was present in a lot of the older buildings in the conservation area, and it does appear to suffer from the widest range of decay processes, and it tended to be in a poorer condition in relation to the other sandstone types. But if you look at this image on the left of the thin section, you can see all these blue areas, and these are the areas of porosity that I was talking about, and that is where your moisture and things are going to move through the stone, so it's important to understand how connected those pores are are and how that will behave in the context of your building. And sandstone type two, um, it looks quite similar. It's a bit more buff colored, a bit more orange. And um, it was likely sourced from a very similar uh, quarry or deposit, but it contains a lot more iron oxide minerals. So when you look at the thin section here, all these black spaces are iron oxide and carbonaceous minerals, which are opaque in thin section, which means you can't shine light through. So they just appear black. And these are what give the stone that kind of reddy tinge and the kind of speckled mottled orange appearance. And um, it, the iron oxide staining does tend to be very, very variable, but it will be more concentrated around exposed faces. And that's just because where moisture and things are getting in, it's allowing the remobilization of the iron within the stone. And that then imparts the, the staining. Um, sandstone type three, um, this one here was taken, this is a really good quality stone. This was taken from an internal um, 
paving stone from the town hall and um, it's very similar to types of stone you see from famous Edinburgh quarries like hale sandstone and which has a very distinct bedded appearance and you can see this sort of line of black the stripe that goes through that's essentially like a layer of this um, this bedding and you can tell it that in the rock it was probably a sign of sort of an area of weakness because you can see there's quite a lot of pore space above this and so that's an a, an important thing to consider when you're thinking about how water and moisture will move through these types of stone. But the, the stones that were worked at, at Craig Leith and Hales around about Edinburgh are the same age of deposits as we have around here. So we're formed in very, very similar conditions. And this type of rock is quite commonly referred to as a feek rock and was usually used for lower quality things like rubble work, foundations, or for steps and paving like the ones here. And the last one, which is stone type four, looks very similar in thin section to stone type three, but this one is of way poorer, poorer quality. And that is because the beds that you find within this are a lot closer together. So there's a lot more areas of weakness in there, a lot more places that this stone can decay and spall off. And what we noticed throughout Inverkeething is this is the, the stone type that seems to have been painted. Um, and that I think has probably been because of the poor quality nature of it and this sort of decay that people were seeing. One of the obvious solutions people would have thought would just be to, to put paint on there. And unfortunately, if it's a film forming paint, for example, um, you're going to have a lot of issues and it'll actually probably make the problem a lot, lot worse. And this type of stone is mentioned, it's very, very characteristic of stone quarried from the Anstruther and lower limestone formations, which outcrop in Fife. And this is a geological map, uh, which shows you the different formations. So the green bit again is your igneous stuff, but everything around about that is sedimentary material. So we have the lower limestone formation, which is the most famous and important of the formations. And that's because it contained the lower set of the workable uh, coal fields in Fife. And they were worked around about Cowdenbeath and Loch Yelly and around Kirkcaldy and Dunfermline. And this is also where the, uh, the limestone resources that we used for mortar throughout the central belt came from as well. And there are a lot of marine limestones in the lower limestone formation, like here in Charlestown, the Black Hall limestone is part of this. And the other formations are the Pathhead formation, Anstruther, Pit and Weem and Sandy Craig formation. And you don't really need to worry about these names. These are just how geologists categorise rocks so that when we're out looking at them, we can tell um, the type of environment and what it belongs to in terms of its age and correlating it to rocks elsewhere in Scotland. Um, so what we did was to have a look at some of the old quarries to try and work out where the stone actually came from and compare these. Um, so this one was taken from Resyth Quarry and Resyth Quarry is actually landfilled now but you can still access rubble so some of the uh, rubble material was taken and on the left you have a um, sample from Recyth and thin section and on right the stone type three which um, you can see are very very similar so if you look at the sort of size and the shape of the grains and how they're distributed they look very very similar in appearance and this one here um, was a site that uh, one from Grange Quarry. So Grange Quarry is up near Burn Island and that's on the left hand side. On, on the right hand side you have stone type S1. Now Grange Quarry is a very very famous quarry back in its day for being worked and they were actually quarrying it to get to the Birdie House, House limestone which sits underneath and that was the most important and economically valuable resource. But in doing that there were some beds in, in Grange which were well well known to be make excellent ashlar stone and they were known as they were taken out the quarry to they would cut them straight away and they would leave them and they said it would become excellent what they'd call liver rock and um, some areas of Grange though have very very poor quality sandstone and um, so that's you know it's just a, it's very variable by nature and it's very important to understand these when you're thinking about the replacements 
And here we have a um, sample from Kalalo Quarry, which is on the left. Now you've probably heard of Kalalo in more recent times, and that's because it was opened for a period for conservation. Um, it's no longer operating at the moment, but there, I think there is still some resources from Kalalo by obviously depending on your um, the size and quantity you needed. But this was most similar to the stone that we saw of stone type two. And you can see that in the thin section, you've got these patches of your sort of iron minerals, and these are what imparted that kind of orange colour to it, but very, very similar, look like a good match there. So a wee case study, because I'm aware that I can talk about rocks for a very long time, so I will try and summarise this as quickly as I can. Um, Kalalo Quarry, and uh, this is a picture of one of the faces here, and you can see that there is a lot of variation in the sizes of the beds here. And um, that's to do with um, the geology itself and how it was laid down. But you can see just from these hand specimens that I picked up how incredibly variable it can be over such a small space. So if you look at the sandstone on the top there, you've got this big sort of orange line going through and that is, that is to do with the iron staining. And that's probably because this bit has been exposed for a while. However, if you look at the bit on the bottom here, you've got this mottled sandstone, which we saw typically throughout Inverkeithing, a lot of the rubble work. And on top, this very, very pale, pale coloured sandstone. And the paler coloured sandstone, when you find this in the bigger, massive beds, it was usually used for ashlar work. Um, but it just shows you that over such a small area, you can have, even if it's the same quarry, a lot of variation in the quality and the appearance of the material. And this is some more samples from Kalalo, um, showing the, the natural variation across the quarry. And this was just how the, the environment changed as this rock was being deposited. So the, the river system switched directions. You had periodic storm events. So the one on the left where you see all this black material at the top, that's all got organic matter like plants and things that has been mixed in, probably because of a storm and being deposited. And these all influence the behavior and the appearance of the storm. Um, so I'm going to move on to mortar now very quickly and um, as Stacey mentioned we saw sort of quite a variability in the mortars but some very good examples of um, what were considered to be sort of local mortars and I've got some thin section images here now this is an image of um, one of the harling samples and all this material up here is actually shell fragments. Now these are pieces of shell like bivalves that you find on the beach today and these were quite commonly incorporated in aggregate but also used to uh, produce lime as well. And here's another nice example of a bivalve fragment and in here we can see that there is all this blue space. So these are areas of patches in the mortar where there is porosity or voiding. And this all influences how this behaves. And what I would normally do when I look at a mortar is I look for specific things uh, that tell me how that mortar is behaving and how strong it would have been. And one of those things are looking at lime inclusions. And this sort of blob in the middle here is a lime inclusion. And inside you can see this sort of patchy grape like mineral. And this is a clinker component. And clinker components are what impart the hydraulic properties to your lime. But by looking at a thin section, you were I was able to see that this clinker had formed within the lime inclusion and therefore was actually having no impact on the binder overall. So we knew that this lime was uh, non-hydraulic to feebly hydraulic. And this is a, a picture of it in hand specimen there. And um, there was no evidence of any other additives like epoxylan uh, to make it set faster. So that's things like coal ash, for example. Um, but there was no clinker, uh, no be light or anything found or any hydraulic components found in the actual paste in the binder itself. So we know that it was non-hydraulic to feebly hydraulic. And, and we also graded the sand from there and took some sand from the beach in Inverkeithing where the river uh, meets the mouth and you can see it's, it's pretty much a, an almost perfect match, very similar in mineralogy and um, yeah it was probably where they sourced it from because it would have been full of shell fragments as well. 
And in terms of future supplies, um, we would always say that um, local resources should be used as uh, you know where possible. And um, there is not many quarries in the in Scotland at the moment that are working these carboniferous deposits. A lot of them are based in sort of Northumberland and northeast of England. And um, what we would do when we do a stone match for you is we would have a look at the sample and provide you in the context uh, of thinking about the mortar and everything as well. Um, the best stone in terms of not only its performance but its appearance as well. And when it comes to uh, aggregates, uh, we have our aggregates database here. So we're able to give you a, a matching sand and you've seen from Ross's images how important that is in the texture of your, your finished mortar and making it match with the original. And um, hot mix mortars can be an alternative as well. And that's something if you um, want it to discuss more, you can get in touch with us and we have experience in specifying these and can give you training as well. And um, for stone, you can go to um, stone yards that are currently cutting the stones that were specified. Now, all these are uh, carboniferous sandstones, which are outcrop in Northumberland. And you can get those um, details there from like Hutton Stone, who are currently cutting those. But it is careful to consider, obviously, what beds they're currently working at that time, which is why we always say to get samples or speak to the quarry or stone yard before you actually order any of the stone. But I'm sorry because I totally did run on there. Um, so I hope that was an okay summary for everyone, but happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Katie. I think um, if there's no questions for Katie, or we've got another, um, well, we've got a QA and a at the end. Um, if anybody has any more um, questions for Katie, then we can have them at the end as well. Okay, um, sorry about my um, presentation earlier. I had no idea um, I wasn't sharing my screen properly um, and I couldn't see the chat at all. So I had no idea. So let's hope um, this next one will be properly shared. Um, so I'm hoping everybody can see that all right oh, as I try and um, see everyone. Okay, so um, as I had mentioned earlier, there were a lot of painted buildings um, in Inverkeithing and it's quite common to paint buildings to improve their appearance or to protect them for various reasons, but it's usually the material used that is the defining factor in whether that's successful or not. This is maybe a little bit of a scary photo, um, but it tells a lot um, and is a good start to look at this sort of thing when looking at paint removal and the considerations as to why we might suggest it. Is there damage? So yes, we can see there is damage. Obviously, there's damage to the painted um, surface itself, and there is potentially damage beneath it as well because of all the trapped moisture behind that impervious layer of paint, or several, many layers of paint in this case. Um, and um, the original lime finish can actually be seen underneath. I, it's just about visible in this photo, but there's actually flecks of a more golden lime wash underneath. Um, so this is actually the half crown, which is um, formerly the Royal Hotel. I actually think I've got that wrong. I don't think it is the half crown. It's the... Um, the pub further up. Um, so you can see that it was originally lime washed probably many years ago and that's good evidence to suggest that it would be um, 
you know, it should be lime washed now. Um, either again, as we discussed earlier, as a decorative, purely decorative, just to enhance the um, aesthetics of the building, or to give it some protection if the uh, stone type is perceived to be of a poorer quality. The stone type wasn't actually too bad, but I think just because of the um, many, many layers of paint and complete saturation probably over many, many years, it is actually starting to sand and um, become decayed underneath. If we left this unfurbished, unrefurbished, it would probably start to decay even faster because um, there's concentrated areas now of water ingress and allowing more water in and not really allowing it back out is gonna be very detrimental. So there is a case here for removing the paint because in every paint removal project, justification is important into actually doing the whole process because it is quite extensive, it's expensive, and it can also be sometimes damaging to the stone itself. So when we're talking about modern, modern paints, we're talking about the methods of curing. So when we say, when we call modern paints form forming, it's the manner in which it cures. So form forming paints cure to, to form a solid impervious film. Let more traditional materials such as lime paints or even more modern mineral or silicate paints cure in a different way. They cure much more like lime does where it forms a, um, a coating of the inner pores of the material rather than a solid film. It must be said though that mineral and silicate paints, while they do cure in a way that allows breathability and vapor passage, it does actually become um, stuck, for want of a better word, to the substrate and is therefore not reversible. Um, so they are a good um, technical use of the material for uh, porous masonry, but it must be uh, noted that they are actually not reversible. Modern materials, modern paints, uh, lime paints, silica paints also have a degree of additives which aid pigmentation, uh, water repellency, those sorts of things we can also, if used in uh, specific places and for specific purposes, can help to save fabric, um, but should be really uh, considered properly before specifying. So this is um, again, a, an area of, of degraded paint. So modern paint technology has progressed um, to become more resistant to UV rays because that is one of the major downfalls of modern paints is because those sort of plastic based UV rays tend to degrade them and they break up and they flake and crack and become brittle. So here you can see these, this is probably a bit of an older paint that's been used and it has broken up and flaked and has become rather brittle um, particularly at a uh, ground level where there's a lot of um, uh, wetting and drying and some probably some salt attack as well from being near the, the, the path. Here you can see it's not maybe only uh, causing some damage to the stone um, and in this area as well it's also causing some damage to the timber. Um, this is actually a timber plaster. Um, and while um, modern paints are seen to be effective and efficient, um, they also do actually require topping up or complete renewing. So they're not a save all, um, catch all, um, but modern paints do make it a little bit more difficult to coat over because they are solid films. So wherever, oops, sorry, wherever you can see um, a previous coating you can see where it's flaked off and uh, and is visible then on top which is not really aesthetically pleasing but it's not very technically great either it's not very um long lasting whereas if you used a more uh, traditional lime wash or a modern lime paint or silica paint if you recoated that would just coat the pores 
it would be a much more harmonious finish and it wouldn't be quite so obvious where you've recoated um, on top of. It does, um, mo uh, traditional uh, finishes like lime paint and, well, and lime wash do require a little bit more maintenance, but as you can see, modern paints don't really stand up to, to, to a lack of maintenance either. So we've decided that something needs to be done, the paint needs to be removed, a scheme of removal is required. So the first um, step in a removal process is to trial the removal techniques which are suggested for that substrate type, starting with the least abrasive and damaging, working up to a little bit more abrasive and always trying to minimize the time um, working with wet techniques. Trial panels are good to assess the efficacy of the repair of the removal technique and again to gauge time um, required also for costing purposes uh, and um, knowing how long the whole process will take. Um, there are several techniques using a um, combination of different techniques together, which overall comes up with a, a scheme of, of um, cleaning. Um, so in terms of um, the less abrasive uh, techniques such as steam cleaning, there are certain pretreatments that can uh, help to soften paint, which increases the efficacy and efficiency of the steam cleaning itself and then reduces the time of actual saturation of the stone. Saturation of the stone is something you really want to avoid and is when you start seeing staining um, and some decay further on uh, post cleaning, or post paint removal is probably because there's been an oversaturation of the stone for an extended amount of time and the salts within the stone have been mobilized and then start crystallizing on the surface of the stone. So if we're um, looking at um, the removal techniques which are available to us, um, these are the low abrasive techniques. So starting from the bottom, which is basically just manual scrubbing with the wire brush, and then moving up to a low pressure water um, system, which is basically just, you know, a domestic sort of um, kasha situation or the like. Um, higher pressure can be then used if it is a little bit more persistent, but it is still if uh, efficient to use without having to move to a superheated um, steam cleaning uh, system. However, most uh, situations where there is um, several layers or very well adhered um, paint in uh, the majority of, of a facade, steam cleaning does tend to be the most efficient um, system purely because when uh, used with a pretreatment, softening the paint, um, steam can be very efficient in reducing the time actually required for the water to be touching the stone. So anything that very easily um, takes the, the um, paint off with minimal time of, of um, saturating the stone is um, the most beneficial. So working a little bit more um, abrasive, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, using things like brush pads um, for more persistent areas. So if you use something that's um, the most efficient for the vast majority of, of a facade and really only concentrate more abrasive air, um, techniques on um, the most persistent areas. Needle guns, again, could be um, something for just small areas. Um, needle guns um, are restricted for hand-on vibration time, so uh, are really have to be limited use on that. The um, next step up from that is um, the, a system such as TORC, which uses a very fine um, particulate, which is slightly more aggressive in terms of removal, but is more efficient in removing 
uh, coatings such as cement washes, which was quite common, um, liner stone, that sort of thing. And again, without becoming too um, mechanically abrasive, because there are situations where you can um, start really affecting the surface of the stone, re refinishing it, retooling it, and that's what you really want to avoid. Now I've got um, two videos here and I'm hoping this is going to work. Um, these are not endorsing these contractors at all. I'm just purely using these as a um, as an aid to kind of explain um, my point. Um, can everyone see that video? No, I can't, I can't see it. Okay, I'm not really sure why I can't see anything else on this other than my screen. Um, okay, can you see this now? Yes. Okay, I'll go back to the beginning. So here um, you can see um, this is the DOF or similar, any sort of, uh, this is actually a Thermatec, it's just a steam cleaner. The speed at which the, the paint is actually coming off the stone is quite, it's quite fast. It's coming off very easily. It's not really much um, lance time. So it's not really getting too saturated. I would suggest that that, that um, paint has either been pre-treated with something because it's quite soft or it's not a very thick coating. Um, so that removal technique is very efficient for that type of of situation. Again, not endorsing any contractors. I am just using that as a method of um, showing you what could be done. Um, I'm just going to take you to another video, which is just going to show you um, an alternative and you can make your own assumptions. <laughs> So can everyone see this? I don't know why my... Um... Yes, it is, it is working, yeah. Okay, all my controls have completely disappeared. Um, so in this, this is um, what might happen if you did leave it um, and didn't intervene. You can see the stone behind the paint has completely turned to sand. There's basically no integrity left to that stone whatsoever. Um, and really, if that was left over an even longer extended time, you'd be possibly looking at some stone um, repairs, some indents or you know, surface repairs or something. This um, is an extreme example, but is probably quite common when it comes to um, modern paints and this is the reason why we suggest removing paint not because it's um, aesthetically displeasing um, but also because it's technically not the right thing to do I don't know why this keeps doing this and I have just one more to show you Okay, can everyone see this screen? Yes. Okay, so in this um, example, if you compare it to the first one, the speed and the ease in which they are removing this paint is not quite the same. There is quite a lot more um, lance time required on each area. The paint isn't really coming off in its entirety. The lance is very close to the stone, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend. There is, doesn't really seem to be, um, or ha have been used any pre-treatments to soften the paint. Uh, it seems pretty stuck on. So this technique um, 
with this particular um, project probably is not recommended. So if this was a trial in this instance, I would say that's taking too long. It's not very efficient and it's probably going to damage the stone, the brick, whatever it is. And in this instance, I would probably say a pretreatment is required because it's going to cause some damage long term. It's just a little visual representation of what is good and what is or not recommended. And you can see just by doing trials, you can gauge that quite easily. So we'll go back to our slideshow. So the risks in doing this, um, so you, you can see um, quite easily from those videos that one of the risks, um, the most obvious one is, is removing too much of the surface of the stone and being too abrasive um, and too harsh on the stone. But oversaturation is one of the key things that um, is uh, an issue long-term post cleaning or post paint removal, because like I was saying, it mobilizes salts within the stone and it's they then are brought to the, the surface and crystallize and cause delamination, dusting and that sort of decay. When using chemicals or pretreatments, um, there is a specific way in which they are um, recommended to be used. All manufacturers have guidelines on how to use them. And usually pre-wetting the stone is one of the recommendations so that the, the pretreatments and chemicals can't penetrate the stone too deeply and cause a breakdown of the internal matrix. That again, further will cause um, staining and salt crystallization when drying. So the proper use of pretreatments when using them is also very important because it can cause some damage. Overcleaning, again, in that last example, I would say there is some risk of overcleaning that because um, it's not very efficient and you tend to go over the same area a few times in order to get the all of the paint off. That is a combination could be of poor training for the operative themselves, or again, not really choosing the right um, techniques um, or right system. In the, the case of um, talk or other sand blasting sort of techniques, um, there is a risk of dust inhalation of the actual particulates themselves, because uh, some of them do use silica based particles, and that is a risk for health and safety reasons. So like I was saying, when you are using a specific um, technique, if you're using pretreatments, if you're using a, a, a DOF, a Thermatec, whatever it is, you need to follow the manufacturer's guidelines and your operatives need to be trained to use that machine. Always treat the surface of the stone. Um, never let anything penetrate too deeply into the stone and don't oversaturate the stone when using chemicals either because it just encourages those materials to then um, be soaked into the stone. When, uh, like we've seen with those um, two examples, trial panels are so good at gauging efficacy of the cleaning techniques, of, of combination of techniques, and using them on small panels are much better than um, deciding halfway through a scheme that it's not going to work, um, it's taking too long, things are going to get damaged. So using small trial panels to, to gauge efficacy of removal is much more um, sympathetic. Allowing enough time, again, trial panels will give you some idea of how long it'll take, but allowing enough time for um, a program of removal will put less pressure on the contract and um, less pressure on having to get things done quickly and the temptation of moving to more abrasive techniques for faster results. And always consult experts or professionals if there is any doubt in whether the substrate's suitable or the chemical the pretreatments are suitable or the technique is suitable for a particular example. This is an example we found um, where likely paint was removed but mechanically so this uh, is um, what happens when you use a scutch chisel to remove um, it could have been a very um, finely 
applied um, cement render, cement wash, or any kind of coating. But this is the sort of thing you want to avoid. You want to avoid retooling, refinishing, um, or removing any of the surface of the stone. You want to keep the surface as um, original as possible, keep the tooling, and keep the finish without really altering um, what was there originally. This was, um, I think, quite freshly applied, of quite recently applied um, masonry paint. And you'd think with the key of that, that um, scutch marks, it would be fine, but no, at the base, it is already failing. Um, so modern materials, like I said before, do not actually save all. So when we're looking at now a freshly uh, cleaned building, paint's been removed, um, it's dried out, um, what do we do next? Do we replace the finishes as they were? Do we um, haul it? Do we paint it? So as we've seen, um, it possibly could have been painted for a reason, maybe aesthetics or to protect. However, if there's a historic um, precedents and there's evidence that you can find, so uh, remnants of lime wash, etc. Then that's good basis um, for justification for re lime washing it or re um, finishing it in a similar way. So if you are then deciding to paint building, um, always use breathable paints such as lime paints or lime wash. Lime wash is the most traditional um, method. And you can get ad additives which um, you can add to lime wash to make it slightly more um, water repelling, slightly more pigmented, um, before you then get to the sort of um, extreme end of the scale, which is mineral and silicate paints. Like I said, they are very good and they're very technically durable, but they are um, not they're irreversible and um, in conservation terms um, we try and make everything reversible when we are repairing buildings. So we could also just leave the stone exposed if the stone is in good condition, if it was meant to be that way um, when it was originally constructed um, and that that is a perfectly good justification in um, finishing a building. Some masonry may require intervention. So like that other video, um, some stone replacement may be required, some surface repairs might, might be required. And sometimes in those cases, we, we've seen that before post um, removal of paint finishes or render finishes, the stone is in such a poor condition that sometimes wholesale replacement of the stone is just actually too, too much of an intervention. And in those cases, sometimes rendering can be an option because it retains what's there already, it protects the masonry and it provides a decorative finish. So um, it's important at that stage though, if there is a lot of um, stone decay that it is assessed um, so that an, uh, a a proper decision can be made whether technically going forward it should be protected and if it should be if there should be some stone replacement to um, further protect the masonry. And um, I'll finish on this my last well, one of my last pictures that I took in Invercieving, um, and it's from the gardens of the Friary, and it's a view over the fourth well, over in Keething Bay, but it's um, maybe not such an accurate description of, of our time surveying in, in Keething because it was actually really cold all the time, not uh, quite as bonny as it was when we were doing in, um, Cooper, but still um, a, lovely, a lovely town with lots of interesting things, um, which we enjoyed a lot, I enjoyed a lot, and I'm glad I've managed to come back and do one last thing for the SLCT before um, I am now a commercial surveyor. <laughs> so um, has anybody got any questions? We've got, oh, sorry, no, we've got um, one more to go. Um, Fiona now will um, speak on surveys um, and stakeholders. Thanks, Stacey. I'll be um, just very brief on this. Um, 
Um, but thank you to all the speakers today. I, I found it really interesting to get that overview of the really in-depth survey that you carried out. Um, it's fascinating to, to hear all that technical detail, but also take a step back and just think about how very basic maintenance can really um, preserve stone for, for much longer. Um, I mean, the, the aim of this, this stone state survey, the reason we commissioned it um, was that we could get a better understanding of the condition of the building um, within the conservation area of Inverkeeping, their repair and maintenance needs, um, and then to identify the most uh, appropriate use of materials for their repair. And I really do think that this has been a great <clears throat> kind of synthesis in bringing all that together. Um, and the aim as well has been that this should be useful for homeowners, the homeowners to get a better idea of the repair needs of their buildings, but there should also be technical detail in there that is of use to um, contractors, architects, surveyors, and so on. So hopefully um, there is a good balance for everyone here. Um, the report is free to access. Um, I didn't make sure. yeah. The report is free to access on our website. So on the Pipe Historic Buildings Trust website, there's an Inverkeeping page, which is specifically all about the Inverkeeping Heritage Regeneration Project. And within that, there's a section on the Stone State Survey. So there's the full detailed report, and then um, a lot of the appendices are included there as well. Um, so these include some of the detailed stone and mortar analyses reports that were carried out. Um, by the Mind Centre. Some of the maps that have been shown here today are included there, and then there's also some generic specifications and guidance for line work. Um, and uh, the Lime Centre also obviously as part of this put together individual mini survey sheets for most of the buildings within the central area of Inverkeeping. Um, so we have copies of that, and any owner who would like to see that for their building and um, are just free to get in touch. So I've put our email address here in bekeeping at buildings.org.uk and then our telephone number as well. So, um, and finally, and as part of this report uh, and survey, we have some high level photos taken of the buildings within in bekeeping using a drone. And those are available as well um, to any building owners or architects specifiers uh, working on buildings. Um, so just to finish then, I'd like to give three examples of how this Stone Slate survey has already benefited in Bekeeping. So first of all, on the townhouse project, the design team who are responsible for the, for the repair work have been able to use the survey to um, correctly specify the replacement stone that will be used during the repair work. Um, so matching stone is, has been identified um, and will be, will be um, specified um, in discussions with contractors who come on to do the work. So that, that's the first bonus. The second one then is for the high street team. Um, the design team there have been able to use this report to identify the correct um, sort of good quality um, traditional sandstone, uh, not necessarily sandstone, but different stones for use in paving um, work within the high street area. And then thirdly, this is at its early stages, but will, as the project goes on, become more and more um, of benefit is for owners for the building repair grant scheme. So owners who are interested in applying for a grant or who have, um, are, are working towards an application for a grant are able to use the, have been able to use the uh, initial surveys of their building to start their conversations off with the, um, a contractor or with an architect or a surveyor who got a good you know, brief snapshot of the outline condition of their building that they can start um, further conversations with, with um, specialists. And obviously once these projects get a little bit further along, um, there will be the correct sort of information for stone matching, uh, lime water repairs and so on. Um, so, I think that's it from me. Um, but thank you very much again for everyone for everyone. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who has come. So it's been really great to see um, more faces. This is the second time it's run, so it's, it's great that it's been um, of interest to people. And I will now stop sharing. And I believe it's the uh, question and answer session then. Yes.
So if anybody's got any questions for any of us, um, just unmute yourself and fire away. Or if there's no questions, I think we'll probably get, be getting to lunch a bit earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to ask, um, how long did the, the survey take you to do? Oh, um, from beginning to end, I think it was, I think about two or three months, um, probably actually boots on the ground and um, actually out surveying and doing sampling. Um, it really didn't help that we had COVID in between um, because then our, our sample analysis and things was delayed. Um, but yeah, it was right in the middle of winter <laughs> and our days were a bit shorter. Um, so yeah, a couple of months, which is for Inverkeithing, it's a, it's a much smaller area than um, what we did for Cooper. Um, it was a lot more um, intensive, I think, what we did for Inverkeithing, just because we found so much more in terms of original finishes, original lime mortars and stone. Um, and um, I suppose we knew what we were looking for the second time round. We learned a lot from Cooper um, and had our, our, our eyes out for a lot more um, defects and things. Um, yeah, probably about two, three months actually surveying. Yeah, could I ask a wee question? It's um, when did the whole project, was, when was it initiated and who initiated it? Um, do you mean the, the stone and slate survey or the Inverkeeping heritage regeneration process? From day one, the, the Inverkeeping uh, regeneration, yeah. Um, yes, well, I mean, the, the project um, technically began in 2019, um, and uh, it is a Fife Council project um, that Fife Historic Buildings Trust um, coordinate on their behalf. Um, and the project, I mean, the project started on the ground in 2019 with all these different strands that I've mentioned earlier. But obviously the planning for that went back several years in advance of it. The, the funding applications to the main funders, you know, began two, three years uh, ahead of that. Right. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks very much. So about 2016, the funding started or something like that? 2017, well, maybe 2018, in fact, 2018, 2019 would have been the, the funding application stage. Yeah, okay, thank you. So if there's any more questions, now's your chance. Can I just add, it's Emma here. I should put my video on. Hi, Emma. Um, hi, thank you very much. Another great presentation. Um, if anybody who's attending today is interested in future training events that we're having, um, if you would like to sign up to our um, newsletter, you'll hear about future events that we're running and training for householders or professionals or contractors. And we're always interested to hear from people about any of their training needs. Thanks, Emma. Okay, well, I think we're actually finishing bang on time, um, which is great. So, um, I'll maybe leave Ros to do the actual sign off because, yeah, I'm not actually the SLCT anymore. <laughs> okay, thanks, Stacey. Okay, so um, everybody who's attended today should receive a CPT, CPD certificate and a link to um, the recording of today as well. Um, don't expect it today, sometime next week, because we're all quite uh, pressured at the moment. So, um, but thank you for joining us and we, we love sharing our information and things we found out with all of you thank you very much that was great thank you cool. thank you thank you bye bye everyone bye